Sorry, I left my glass in there. Right, so. Yeah. See, you've got the mug for water, so. Good. I don't plan to ask any questions, so I don't need to be close yeah. to the mic. Great. I hope so. Nice. We, we are in the process of buying a house. So we may be moving to town. That would be the thing that you can do. Town, Josephine and Latimer. Yeah. 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 Oh man, I thought that was going to be a long. I should have brought my pizza. Uh, so on Josephine, go to one, as you go on Josephine, you can find that now. So the lowest one. So if, we'll be mo so we'll be moving this weekend. Yesterday, like, if, I woke up if, and yeah. like, is this true? So that, if I'm not there, it's because of that. That. Mind you, you were already not really well on pace. So yeah, exactly. And then or Friday, I think it was. I met some other tests. How are you? I'm I'm getting, 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 I came home at 2. Yes. Yeah. You are ready? Yeah, I gotta go to bed. I, 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 so we like watch TV on this. Like, I'm trying to find a way from each and every one of them. I wrote down some questions. <laughs> I was at the one last year. Like, like, trying to like wake up. Like, go right at six. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, that was where I started in January. Why so I did get in? I'm sitting in the back corner. Yeah, I, I kind of I have an idea about it. Was this supposed to be? And I slept. And I'm sure what's wrong with the presentation? Just in case these things are going to be on any like, minute. Three minutes prior to, yes. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. I was just telling her about my sick. <laughs> so, I guess no, I know, but you never know. You might be sitting there. So. Yeah, no, she was being very quiet. No. <laughs> a little harder, Jesse. A little harder. Hello, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, I'm, I'm not Mayor Dooley today. Well, I, I sort of am. I'm sitting, acting mayor, and uh, I just get a little practice. Every, every council gets a chance to have a little practice, and this is my turn. And that's why I'm here. Um, so, I'd like to do, the first thing is uh, the Aboriginal acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Tanaha, Selix and sorry, Salix and oh man, now I'm, now I'm nervous. Sinex, sorry, Salix and Sinaix peoples, and is home to the Metis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honor their connection to land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. Uh, are there any late items? Seeing there are none, we'll move on to the next, which is to the adoption of the agenda. Councillor Renwick, second. Councillor Anderson. And uh, and so what we're going to do is first... All in, all in favor. Oh, all in favor? <coughs> Thank you. And uh, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, a presentation of the Heritage Award. Um, and so... Uh, in accordance uh, with uh, council policy, the CDC Heritage Working Group administers the Heritage Award. Uh, this year, uh, there were a record number of applications and nominations for this award. Therefore, there is also a special citation. The 2018 Heritage Award, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce, uh, sorry, Astrid Hiredale, um to help out with this. Thank you, Astrid. And Astrid uh, is the chair of the CDC's Heritage Working Group. On to you, Astrid. Good evening. 
You almost ruined the surprise. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> glad I, I'm glad I stopped. <laughs> The City of Nelson's Heritage Award was established to recognize and publicly appreciate individuals, groups, businesses, or other organizations who have demonstrated leadership in heritage restoration, renewal, or promotion, and to acknowledge the contribution heritage makes to Nelson's vitality, well-being, and identity. The 2018 Heritage Award is being presented to local historian Peter Bartle. Peter spent over two years researching knocking on doors and delving into the Sean Lamb archives at Touchstone's Nelson Museum to identify and document a unique aspect of Nelson's her architectural heritage. The result is his comprehensive and beautifully designed book, The Modern Heritage of Nelson Architecture from 1920s to the 1960s. This offers extensive photographic and textual information on over 70 of Nelson's Art Deco, Mission Revival and Modernist buildings, both commercial and residential. Peter organized and guest curated with Jane Merckx the exhibition entitled Art Deco in Modern Times at Touchstone's Nelson Museum. And he generously donated his time and knowledge to the community by providing educational presentations and walking tours based on his research. Through this, he has broadened the community's knowledge about this unique aspect of Nelson's heritage and challenged all to look at their hometown in a new way, seeing the architectural beauty we walk by every day. The City of Nelson is proud to present Peter Bartle with this award. His depth of knowledge and contagious passion for his subject have ensured that an important part of Nelson history has been kept alive for future generations. Would you autograph my book? Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Don't lose your envelope on the back there, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so as was mentioned in the introduction there's so many individuals who wanted to uh, be recognized or people who were called out as heritage innovators as heritage heroes in this community which speaks volumes about who it is that we are as a community so as a result uh, the city of Nelson would like also to formally recognize two incredible residents Ron and Francis Wellwood, for their lifetime work in preserving, promoting, and documenting Nelson's history. Ron Wellwood sat on the City of Nelson's Heritage Committee for almost 20 years, compiling three heritage brochures for the city, walking, motoring, and cemetery, in addition to writing numerous articles on Nelson for BC History Magazine. After arriving in Nelson in 1969, he became immersed in the area's heritage and history as a university librarian at Notre Dame University of Nelson and David Thompson University. In this role, he immediately commenced to amass a collection of Kootenayana. <laughs> as print and non-print resources of the region were not being collected and preserved in one location. After the university closed in 1984, 
This inventory was transferred to the Nelson Public Library and the Nelson Museum Historical Society, and he continued to collect as the librarian at Selkirk College from 1984 to 2000. These collections are accessible and continue to be a valuable resource for researchers. Now, Francis Wellwood was on the board of directors of the Nelson and District Museum Archives Art Gallery and Historical Society for over 20 years. And she's an accomplished historian writing many articles for BC History and local news media. In the early 1990s, she began to research the life of Annie Garland Foster for a, new, for a Nelson Museum exhibit, The Woman of Nelson, 1880 to 1950. An early woman graduate of the University of New Brunswick, Garland Foster was the first woman elected to Nelson City Council in 1920. Frances but spent nearly two decades painstakingly researching and gathering de the details for this en en enigmatic woman's life, pardon me, publishing her full-length biography of Foster, Passing Through Missing Pages, in 2011. Uh, the book is available at the Touchstones Nelson Museum gift shop, if you haven't picked <laughs> it up yet. Both Ron and Frances are incredibly active volunteers. They lead walking tours showcasing Nelson's history to locals and visitors. For almost 30 years, they have regularly attended the British Columbia Historical Federation conference as um, the museum as Touchstones delegates. They are incredibly enthusiastic in promoting Nelson and its vibrant and diverse history. Um, a recent <laughs> a recent example of this is that they met uh, a couple not from Nelson on the chairlift, invited them to Touchstones Nelson Museum, and somehow convinced them to be members of the museum, even though they live in Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> the Wellwoods have contributed greatly to the preservation of the history and heritage of Nelson, and it is the city of Nelson's pleasure that they be jointly recognized with this special citation for their absolutely incredible years of service. don't have your book. Thank you, Astrid. Finished. I got my little hand up. Oh, Francis, yeah, you're selling tickets, though. So? Yes. Oh, Pat's got a copy of your book. Yeah, Thank you. Here you go, ladies. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to add a, a little personal note. Uh, when I first <clears throat> got the job as counselor, I started walking down the aisle here, and uh, Annie, Gar Annie Garland Foster caught my eye one day and I because of all the photographs there and I was looking at her and I'm like oh wow I, I didn't see that, that woman was there and then I kind of I counted off the period of time from the beginning of Nelson I think it was about 20 years or so 30 years and then she was elected and there wasn't another woman elected for about another 30 years so she really was you know super innovative and it's pretty phenomenal what she must have actually had to work with in her time. So thank you for writing that book. All right. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, so the next item is the adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting. 
So I need a motion to adopt the minutes from November 27th and December 13th. Uh, Councillor Renwick? Second. Mayor Dooley? And all in favor? All in favor? Thank you. And uh, is there anyone who would like to have a public participation from the gallery? No one? All right. So moving on, we're going to do um, delegations. So tonight we're having seven presentations of organizations in town. And the beginning of it will start with the Cultural Development Committee. But it just, uh, Sorry, did I miss something? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, as you can see from the agenda, um, there's a time oh, for yes. each presentation, and it's really important that we try and stick yes. to it tonight because we've got quite a few of them. Yes. And we still have work to do after as Thank well. Thank you. Or so, so. Thank you, Mayor Dooley. So, um, so yes, so the, the way that this is going to work is each presenter will have 20 minutes total. I think the idea was 10 minutes for presentation and 10 minutes for questions. And there is a card system we're going to use here. So Sarah's going to hold up a card. That's five minute warning. And then the red card is you're done. <laughs> because there's seven uh, delegations tonight, we really do have to keep on track. So with that. Let's do this. So. <laughs> I'll just wait for Sarah to cue our PowerPoint. We won't start you until then. Okay. It's a minute already. <laughs> yeah, please don't start the clock yet. <laughs> We're just an innovative community here. We see good elevator pitches. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll keep, I have a stopwatch here. Okay. Efficiency. I know. Efficiency. I like this. Sorry. Um, while we're waiting, <laughs> um, do you want to just talk a little bit about the Cultural Development Qu Committee quickly? <laughs> the chair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the Cultural Development Committee is a, a group of cultural organizations that meet monthly um, to discuss the cultural happenings of uh, the city of Nelson and how we can help the city of Nelson to achieve their, their cultural dreams and desires. Very nice. Very succinct. Thank you. It's a volunteer, just to add, it's a volunteer group and really it's the liaison between the city and the arts uh, community. So it kind of, you know, the communication goes both ways from the city to the arts and from the arts to the city. So that's the really important. Bit. And we help with things like uh, public art and infrastructure. Um, we help to... Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we help with the uh, community initiatives programs funding with the Columbia Basin Trust. Uh, we help to secure the jury for that as well. So, um, just a couple of the ways that we help the city. Does that go on the screen? Yep, it will. Great. <coughs> okay. Oh, and I'm Sydney Black. I'm the chair of the Cultural <laughs> Development <laughs> Committee. And I'm, I'm Joy Barrett. I'm the Cultural Development Officer. Okay. All right. Um, Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. I'm okay, just... and I'm going to press start. Okay. Go. <laughs> she's, so, she's waiting that for PowerPoint that PowerPoint coming oh. up? I just, sorry, I do need to wait for the PowerPoint just because it's kind of, it's visual. Yeah, it's the arts. We need, we need our pretty pictures here. <laughs> okay, there we go. perfect. There we go. Okay. Um, so 2019 has been a very productive year for the CDC. As part of the Hall Street Stores to Shores development, we partnered with Public Works on three art and infrastructure projects, Mosaic Tile on three locations along Hall Street, IODE Park, Front, Front Street and Lakeside, and benches and railings for the new Lakeside sitting stairs. These were all done through a juried process, working with Public Works and the Purchasing Department to put together a project plan, budget and request for proposals assembling and chairing an external jury of professionals to review the applications 
and then working directly with the artist and public works on production and completion of the projects. So the, t the two tiles that you see here are by Winlaw artists, uh, Carl Schlichting and Rabia. And they've been very, very popular with the community. So as part of this Hall Street pod project, uh, the cedar benches you see on your left were designed by Revelstoke artist Lindsay Burke and built in partnership with local companies Arkwright Welding and Nelson Tiny Houses. The simple and elegant design concept was inspired by the boats and the waterfront where they'll soon be located. So the picture you see here is actually during the construction process. And since then they've been coated and they're ready for installation uh, by Public Works once the weather is amenable. And the railings pictured are by Nelson artist Nathan Smith and were fabricated with a variety of sheet metals, creating a landscape scene including mountains, lakes, clouds, and sky. Our public art initiatives are highly valued by residents who are proud to see the beautification of the city and also with visitors adding to the vibrant experience of Nelson and complementing the downtown heritage architecture. We lease five sculptures annually in our partnership with Castlegar Sculpture Walk and this rotating downtown gallery has been extremely popular with sculptures becoming meeting spots and photo ops. Um, we also moved artist Rabia's sculpture Dancing Myself to its new permanent location at the base of IODE Park and we had her mosaic tile the back of the piece because now it was being viewed from all angles. And also as part of our public art program it, we include an annual maintenance program. So the middle picture you see here is artist and technician Peter Vogelar polishing up the heron down at Lakeside. Oh. An, oh, an additional public art initiative we spearhead is the annual art rental program established in 2016. This program uses proceeds from the Public Art Reserve Fund to lease art for display in City Hall, enlivening and beautifying the spaces, reflecting the creative nature of Nelson and supporting and promoting local and regional artists. This has proven to be hugely popular with the community and will be continuing the program in 2019 with the added feature of displaying historical objects from Touchstone's Museum of Art and History. The city and the CDC's recognition programs have become an important way to honor the tremendous creative talent we have in this city. The Cultural Ambassador Program launched in 2009, and we've since honored 10 artists in visual art, literature, music, video arts, and dance, with performer Allison Gervin receiving the 2019 award. Applications and nominations for this program are increasing every year and further establishing Nelson's reputation near and far as an arts and culture destination which fosters and rewards creativity. Additionally, we partner with local cultural groups for monthly cultural presentations to council and with the League of Canadian Poets to recognize National Poetry Month every April. In 2018, we also continued our collaboration with Nelson Hydro, redesigning and installing utility box wraps on the north side of Baker. These ones document the history of Nelson Hydro and were due for replacement. We've also received significant funding from the Francophone Affairs Program for the Economy Zay Project, an international cultural tourism initiative that draws on the historical tradition of arts and crafts to showcase local artisans, their methods, and their wares. And ongoing initiatives include administrating and facilitating the adjudication of arts, culture, and heritage grants for the city's community initiative funding, and continuing monthly meetings with the CDC working groups, which include reps from the local and regional arts community. In 2019, it's going to be another full year for us, so we've just found out that we are successful in receiving funding from the Veteran Affairs Program to clean and restore the War Memorial in front of City Hall, and that will happen this spring. We'll be continuing this successful partnership with the Nelson and District Arts Council on the Nelson International Mural Festival, which has brought world-class talent to our city. And we are, of course, very enthusiastic about continuing work with the city on the downtown urban design strategy and rail town development and design, and working with local and regional organizations to foster arts development and partnerships. And we will just call up Astrid, <laughs> That's like magic. <laughs> that was fantastic. Okay. We need some comic relief every so often. We do. 
Um, so yes, I'm the chair of the Heritage Working Group, and it's um, been a really interesting year for us. I think the most significant thing that we accomplished is uh, building better relationships, communication pieces with the City of Nelson staff to ensure that we're really aligning with city staff priorities and ensuring that we can um, offer expertise on things like design ideas, uh, heritage protection, and of course continue to build our statements of significance. So we of course also selected Peter Bartle and Ron and Francis Wellwood to receive a special citation, Peter Bartle to uh, receive the award uh, for their incredible contributions to heritage. We'd like to focus a bit on the statements of significance that we are going to be undertaking. So for 2018, as I said, reprioritizing, re moving a little bit away from programming as there are so many organizations like Touchstones Nelson Museum and others who do heritage programming. So wanting to ensure that we are focusing on statements of significance. So 16 statements of significance will be written with 2018 funds. And um, this is something that the city of Nelson staff and the heritage working group have worked together on, which is exciting. For 2019, um, we have heritage plaques for at least two locations within, within city parks. In partnership with the city's development department, we are going to be writing a Columbia Basin Trust uh, heritage grant for heritage planning in the city of Nelson. We are um, going to assist with the, uh, the review of city planning, development, and heritage documents, such as the facility assessment report, the capital plan, of course, the heritage registry and also the Nelson Design uh, Guidelines. And we hope that in 2019, we will, uh, this will depend on our uh, success of the CBT grant, we hope to write at least 13 statements of significance. As such, looking to 2019, the Heritage Award every year is $1,000. Heritage signage, uh, which will be associated with heritage objects moving from Ford to Anderson uh, Street location and in to do to two different parks in the city will be about a thousand dollars we will continue with the Nelson history talks which is a really exciting program that we do uh, which highlights different heritage buildings and the history of those heritage buildings within the community uh, statements of significance 13 each our heritage BC membership and then marketing and communicating said programming And so the cultural development budget request for 2019 is $36,000 towards contractual employment. employment. Uh, the cultural ambassador program, which is $1,150. Uh, attending the Creative Cities Network event, which is $2,000. Uh, the cultural development officer expenses of $1,000 and miscellaneous fees for $750, totaling a budget request of $40,900. And I believe, oh, I'm in charge now. That's it. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, we're happy to take any questions if you have them. Eight minutes, 41 seconds. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I take that extra time for Touchstone Nelson Museum? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? So uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Anybody? Councilor Lockenberg. Um, into the mic. Into the mic. Oh, into the mic. Thank you. Uh, I just love to hear more about plans for the mural fest this year. What's oh, we're going to get to that in the next presentation. Oh, yeah. I'm next. To, I'm going to stay here for like an hour. I'll just sit in the seat. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well then, um, maybe since we have time, and uh, do do we have to use the time? No. 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 We just go on to the next one. So. Okay. I just didn't want to. No, I promise I'll tell you all about it in probably seven and a half minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'll just I'll just wait. Awesome. <laughs> if we want, if we okay, if we want to keep on time according to the schedule here, uh, we would have uh, four minutes, and then it'll be six thirty, which would go into NDAC. So. Okay. Um, I just the statements of significance. I don't know very much about that, and I was hoping you could just elaborate quickly. Yeah. So the statements of statements of significance um, are. We have actually one individual in the community who has uh, the training to write these, and it's Jean-Philippe Stien, who's also the archivist and collections manager at Touchstones Nelson Museum. And so what it entails is uh, research into the history and significance of a building, looking not only at its architectural significance, um, its architectural detailing as to why it should or ought to be preserved, mm -hmm. but also looking at the social significance of the building within the community. Mm -hmm. And so the statement is writing that up 
so that it goes into the Heritage Registry of the City of Nelson, there is opportunity for that statement to then move on to a BC level or potentially a federal level. Uh, we only have one federally designated uh, heritage building, which is the CP Rail, um, CP Rail building. And um, the hope is that it helps to maintain these buildings. And it's part of what we are going to be working on with the uh, City of Nelson Development Department is working on heritage protection and that grant for, through CBT to see what is it that we can do to better better protect and preserve our history here. Thank you very much, and thank you for a beautiful presentation. I liked all the pictures and stuff. It really helps to... <laughs> Jesse, can I just clarify? Yeah, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Manager Cormack would like to clarify, and then we'll have... Uh, yeah, Council just on, on statements of significance, just for councils, it doesn't necessarily have to be a building. It can be a place, right? Yes, absolutely. Like, uh, Baker Street is, I think, has a sta statement of significance as a street. Oh, yeah, and there's, but, I think, some right. parks as some well. Some parks, right? absolutely. And we're hoping also that in 2019, potentially 2020, depending, that we can work with regional <laughs> indigenous nations mm -hmm. to ensure that we're looking at um, sites of significance to the Sinaiaks and the Tanaha people, for mm -hmm. example, working directly with those nations to ensure that we can write those these statements, which indicate Hobbit Rock or indigenous plants uh, mm -hmm. to the area as having heritage significance to the area. Awesome. Yeah. Councilor Renwick. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, uh, I don't know if that was rehearsed, but Sydney sliding out and Astrid sliding in and Joy not knowing, and if Joy did know, you should be an actress. Because that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, just very simply, um, your, a your asks are 6,000 and, and uh, 40,900. <clears throat> what were the asks last year, just because I'm a newbie? The Ask for Heritage Working Group has been consistent for at least the last three Same years. Same ask as last year. Okay. As has the, yeah, I believe it's the same. Okay. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any further questions? All right. Great. With that, we'll go on to the next. Thank you very much. Okay. Grab a cup sip of water. All right. So the next person in line is Miss Black me. <laughs> and uh, she's going to uh, talk about uh, Nelson District Arts Council. Are you ready Sydney? I oh look at that. <laughs> I pride myself on fancy PowerPoint skills. It's it's what I got. <laughs> so <laughs> go Sydney. Acting Mayor Woodward, City Council members, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present to you again today. My name is Sydney Black. I'm the Executive Director of the Nelson and District Arts Council. The Nelson and District Arts Council was formed in 1969 as the Kootenai Columbia Arts Council. We're a registered nonprofit organization. We have eight board members who are committed community members and 100 individual members that represent all different disciplines of artistic practice. Uh, the Arts Council has three pillars of focus, which include producing events like the Nelson International Mural Festival, Art Walk, Appetite for Art, uh, providing artists support, awards and bursaries, whether that's through one-on-one -on -one consultations, uh, through the Hidden Creek Artist Retreat, through our dance school bursaries, or through liaising with the city uh, to advocate for artists' needs in the communities through the Cultural Development Committee. So. Why? Why would we want to fund the Arts Council? Why is this a thing? Um, the Arts Council supports the city's path to 2040 sustainability principles, um, those being healthy neighborhoods, pr prosperity, resiliency, and cultural strength. And we are the lead municipal artist service organization in the community uh, because we are the municipal support organization for a growing sector. In British Columbia, the culture GDP totaled 7.2 billion in 2016, which was a 3.9% gain from the year before. So our sector is growing and they need this support. Uh, we also support the local com economy through production of events and ensure that participating emerging and professional artists are paid fairly. Um, in 2003, which is a long time ago, um, the economic impact of the arts and heritage in Nelson locally, uh, which includes spending that is not directly attributable to the existence of an arts um, economy, was attributed to more than $198 million. So this was before Touchstones was in existence. This is before you had the Civic Theater running as a society. And there's many other arts organizations that weren't in that picture. So this was a long time ago, but still very valid. 
Um, we provide artists with accessible artist support, and we provide community participants with barrier-free programming in public spaces, which ensures that everyone can take part in um, civic, which increases civic pride. Um, and because of your support, which why we would want you to give us money is because we need it so that we can get other money. So it's important that we have municipal funding so that we can secure federal and provincial funding as well, both project and operational. Um, and our vision moving forward is that we are an inclusive organization that supports and promotes artistic and cultural diversity of the vibrant communities that we serve in Nelson and areas E and F. Falling. So, Nelson International Mural Festival. Um, it was really exciting. We created eight murals between June and August 2018, and they were celebrated in the form of a three-day festival. Um, and despite the extreme air quality warning of which this was the worst weekend of the entire summer, we still managed <laughs> to have over 800 people come out throughout the weekend to our workshops, street dance, uh, community, um, like art crawl, and all of the patio parties that we had. It was amazing. Um, and the great thing is that the murals are still continuing to affect the population. So we are still daily getting emails, Instagram shots, um, things like that of people just loving this. And we're also really involved with the school system now. So we found that uh, they want to do tours. So we've been taking um, classes out and doing mural tours, which has been really, really great for everyone. Um, people have been very much appreciating it. Um, Art Walk 2018 was our 30th birthday. Woo! Uh, we had 30 artists in 15 venues and distributed over 5,000 brochures. Uh, we continued to cancel the street closure, which is something that we've done in the past because we like the idea of performance artists performing in the venues. So this drives participants to the actual arts venues, which is really exciting. And again, another barrier-free opportunity for our whole community to be able to go out and participate, experience art, and get it out of the gallery and into the hands of everyone in the community. Um, the Dance Educator Showcase, we had our third, I said second somewhere, but that wasn't true, I think, in the report I wrote you. And so it was our third this year, Dance Educator Showcase. Uh, we had 72 dancers from 11 dance schools. Um, it, it was a packed house at the Capitol. And to date, we have raised over $12,000 for uh, Nelson District Arts Council dance bursaries that are distributed to uh, people in need in the Nelson and District which is very exciting. Uh, we have our Bigby Place Arts Initiative, which is in its second year. We partner with the Kootenai Society for Community Living, and uh, we facilitate the Bigby Place Arts Initiative, which is a monthly program uh, where we bring in professional artists, and they come and they work with adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, we get over 30 participants every month, and they've gone through all sorts of different genres of art, so dance, uh, rock music. They love the Beatles. Um, what else? We've done sculpture. Uh, we've done all sorts of things. It's been really, really awesome. So. Uh, we're going to try to keep that rolling through, which is awesome. And our Rural Artist Support Weekend, uh, which is in collaboration with the Civic Theatre. Um, so we provide local artists with a free weekend symposium so that they can educate themselves on the practice of the business of art, which is a very daunting task for a lot of artists. So we provide opportunities for them to uh, speak to insurance agents, grant writers, bankers, mortgage brokers, things that no artist really wants to deal with in their day-to-day -day lives, but uh, we all end up having to at some point. So um, in providing this, we've been able to really help strengthen um, those artists' business practices, which really helps them helps the whole sector out. Um, am I, and there's no red. No one's been showing me anything. Halfway so. through. Halfway through. Uh, oh, I know. Okay, sweet. Uh, Culture Days 2018. Uh, Nelson was chosen as the key city for Culture Days 2018. So the Arts Council, in collaboration with the Civic Theater and Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism, uh, brought an amazing event to town in September. Over 300 people paraded from Hall Street Plaza down to City Hall, and it was. I just have goosebumps. That makes me all like feely. So there were like youth dancers and people doing parkour off of the. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they were supposed to be doing that, but they. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it was, but it was really amazing, and the rhythm ropers, and just to see this mass of humans all move all together down the street, and all just in pure celebration of what we have here of culture. Yeah, it was every day in Nelson. Well, oh, we yeah, this, this is extra special. This is extra special. Um, so yeah, we were just we were so lucky to get to be a part of that, and it was a really great opportunity for us to be seen on a provincial stage, um, because places like Whistler and like West Bank, like fancy cultural places, have been named. Uh, the key city before, so it was really great for us to be to be involved. Um, Almost done. Uh, Hidden Creek Artist Retreat. It's another opportunity we provide. Um, it's a retreat style setting, so uh, one artist a year is chosen to spend a free, all expenses paid week at Hidden Creek Artist Resort where or retreat where they are able to um, perfect their practices. And so we've given out three, um, and our last uh, recipient was Martha Stokoe, who's a fabulous, fabulous visual artist. 
And financial time. That was rude. That crumpling was rude. Um, I didn't mean it. Sorry, Martha. I love you. Um, so financials. You guys have the hard copy financials in your reports. So just kind of going through. Um, so the major sources of our revenue streams this year were from our self-generated income, which was from ticket sales for the Dance Educator Showcase, um, memberships, commissions, and cash donations, uh, the City of Nelson, uh, British Columbia Arts Council, BC Gaming, the Kootenai, and the Kootenai Columbia Cultural Alliance. So those were our, our major supporters. Um, the CIP grants that we were given, um, they supported our Bigby Place Arts Initiative and our mural, our youth mural that we did on the Youth Center, as well as Art Walk and our RDCK grants, they supported the mural festival as well as our Culture Days kickoff. So we had um, a bit of supplemental income from the Culture Days kickoff uh, events that we had, but uh, yeah, it all it all went out to pay artist fees, which was really exciting. So our total revenues in 2019 were 166 thousand one hundred and fifty dollars, which is like double what we were last year. It was a big year. We had a big year. It was exciting. <laughs> Um, our expenditures uh, were covered by events, which was 35% of the expenditures. Uh, we pulled the artist fees out of that because we wanted to see how much money we were actually getting into their hands. So 29% uh, of our expenditures went to artist fees. Operating costs were minimal, 6%. Our wages and benefits were 27%, and our grants and bursaries were 3%. Um, so we're looking to increase our earned revenues further in 2018 um, via an increase in memberships, partnering with other organizations. And we're also in a position now where we've been rolling um, um, uh, programs through for multiple years so we're avail it's um, a federal or provincial funding is now more accessible to us so we can apply for BC gaming for the programs that we've had for more than a year in a row so we're looking at having that happen so two minutes great I'm almost done. So the Nelson District Arts Council respectfully requests funding from the city of Nelson in the amount of five thousand dollars for our activities in fiscal year 2019 alternately <laughs> Uh, this is a side that is not in writing. Uh, we would request $2,500 in cash for activities in fiscal year 2019, as well as the potential of an in-kind rental space for an office in the city hall building for $2,500, which would be greatly helpful for us, um, especially with the British Columbia Arts Council. Okay. So, future planning. 50 never looked so good. We're 50! It's amazing! We were started in 1969. I can't believe it. Um, it's really exciting. So we're planning on having a good old 50th birthday bash. Uh, that'll be happening in the fall, and my board is working hard on it. It's going to be a multidisciplinary arts extravaganza, extravaganza, if you will. And uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to celebrating all of the hard work that so many people have put into the Arts Council over the last 50 years. And then also the Nelson International Mural Festival. So we're looking at increasing our programming this year with the Mural Festival. We've applied to Heritage Canada so that we can increase our, um, our music portion. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting. Done. Now you can ask me and I can finish talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sydney. All right, so we have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Councillor Luckenberg. Uh, okay, so I, I've actually got a few. Great. Uh, the first one is, um, the office mm -hmm. on City Hall. Um, where are you right now? Nowhere. In my in my kitchen. In your kitchen. Okay. Yes. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then uh, you you said this was um, this was a big year for you, and you did like 2019 to be even bigger. Yes. How much of that was due to Culture Days? Do you think? Uh, Culture Days was what was it? Sixteen. $16,000 we put into that Culture Days event, and that was through, we had a bunch of sponsorships, and we got $5,000 from the province to do that as well. Right. So. Will there be anything like Culture Days, do you think? Well, no, because the Culture Days, that kickoff event is like a one-time thing, but essentially what we are looking at doing is creating the mural festival into Culture Days on steroids, I've been calling it, so basically um, connecting with all of those groups and more, because we've applied for a fairly large grant if we receive it, um, to host local performance artists as well as bring in artists from out of the area. And so, yeah, we are looking at making a, a two-day, a good two-day celebration of all that is the basin. Cool. So, um, so my question I was going to ask before is, how much does the, uh, do the businesses or the, the landlords, the building owners, contribute to the mural zone? So it's really varied. Last year it varied between $1,000 to $4,000 donation. Um, it's all completely up to them, but as long as there's some sort of, um, yeah, as long as they're putting something in, we've been, we've been working it out. So. And, and then um, is it, what's the lifespan of a mural? Up to over 10 years. Longer. It can be longer. Mm -hmm. It depends. Um, I know spray paint has a longer lifespan um, than traditional methods. There, so. do, they, do you ever come back and, 
expect somebody to come back and kind of fix it up. Yeah, so we have actually, you'll notice um, in our financials that we had a surplus this year of uh, $8,000, I believe. $6,000 of that has been earmarked to go to restricted funds for mural maintenance. So we ensure that we have a minimum of, what is it, $80 a year to maintain the murals. Generally, uh, it shouldn't be needed. We do already have to dip into it because there was a little incident on one of our pieces already, but, uh, but it's fine because we have that cushion, so we're fully prepared to deal with it. And will... The, will this building be one of them this year? We are in negotiations about that, and we'll be, we'll be discussing that at some point. But uh, it potentially not for a mural festival as funded through the mural festival, but there's definitely other public art options and opportunities that we have that we're, we're going to be talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Councillor Page? Well, uh, I wanted a little bit more elaboration on the additional ask of the $2,500 in cash. Um, well, <laughs> our our budget, totally, sorry, our budget is uh, uh, well over. It's a hundred and what seventy thousand dollars almost, and we are provided with twenty five hundred dollars of operating fees. So that money we use to leverage operating funding from the BC Arts Council. But the more that we are provided with, the more that we are able to to leverage. So, um, yeah. It's uh, twenty five hundred dollars. It's a small. It's a small amount to leverage, but in kind is also something that we can count towards that. So, um, and also the BC Arts Council has said that it is time for me to have an office. So, we thought that it would be a good a good match if there's space here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Anderson. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you'd mentioned that the students really liked Mural Festival and that you'd been doing tours. And I was wondering if there was any opportunity to have um, some students involved in actually creating a mural as part of... Great question. Well, last year we had a $20,000 BC Arts Council youth mural, which involved youth center, student or youth, and uh, they worked with a youth muralist under 25 uh, who was brought in specifically for that. And as a result of that, they created, with our support, the mural that's now on the front of the youth center. So it's amazing. We started that seed, planted it, and then we um, have helped them negotiate applying for grants and things like that. So we've been really working concept to realization with a group of kids at the youth center, and we're doing it again this year. So they're all they're all amped up and going to be coming and presenting to you guys to apply for CIP funding <laughs> in the next month. So yeah, it's been great. It's really uh, it's inspiring a lot of people to get involved. Thanks, Sydney. And Sydney, didn't they? help jury or select oh yeah so one. they all jury so for that youth artist that comes in they go through the full jury process of the mural festival so they understand it completely what a matrix is what the full scoring system is so we sit down with them they jury everyone who's applied to the mural festival who's under 25 and then they get to pick who comes in and so we have to find a building owner that's willing to accommodate that luckily Julie Kerr was amazing who owns behind or who owns the Tandori Grill building and we were really lucky they uh they did that for us this year and we're hoping that we'll we'll be able to find someone else to do it for us again this year cool Councilor Rennick. Thank you. Uh, Sydney, yes. uh, you said you had, I, I don't know if I missed the number or not, uh, you have member, I know you have a membership. How many members do you have? A hundred. Oh, I thought so, okay. And um, what is your membership fee? Ten dollars. <laughs> Artists, Cal, we want it to be affordable and accessible for all people. That's what our organization is primarily about. I so. think we had this talk, didn't we? Yeah, that's what our, our focus is, is to be accessible <laughs> for all members of the community so anyone can be a part no of it. No problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if you don't mind, <laughs> one other financial question. Yes, what is the, uh, the RDCK provides some funding? Uh, I'm assuming from areas E and F? Yes. Um, what's the breakdown? What is that? So we get $5,000 a year. It's all in the actual report that I sent okay. out. But we get $5,000 a year in program funding for them from for the mural festival, mm -hmm. which they've offered. And I believe they give us another 2500 for uh, culture days this year so I think there's about 7,500 not including CIP funding and that's from both that's from both areas both yes areas. Okay. yeah great thank you yes any further questions okay you guys worked me it was great thank you, you, you <laughs> that was a big day <laughs> thank you so much for your time it's great thank, thank you. you thank you Sydney thank you Sydney all right well we're uh, we're right on time which is great. So the next group is Touchstones. Sydney took that extra time. I said Sydney took that extra time. I don't. I'm not sure I can speak quite as quickly as Sid, but I will do my best. All right, Astro, are you ready to go? I am indeed. Okay. Yes. 
off to the races. Okay. Greetings, Mayor and Council, City staff, and all citizens of Nelson. My name is Astrid Herdahl. I'm the Executive Director of Touchstones Nelson Museum. I've been in this position just over two years now, and it's truly my pleasure to be here this evening on behalf of the board members, our staff, our volunteers, and the district uh, of the Nelson and District Museum to highlight successes, finances, sustainable growth undertaken in 2018, as well as to present our 2019 budget to the City of Nelson, as well as our operating request. Tonight you'll also hear about longer term vision, time dependent, <laughs> as well as the direction of, of your museum, archives, public art gallery. And we know that it's going to be a bright future, uh, innovative and it will impact our community and beyond. So I wanted to talk first about just the overall value of the arts and heritage sector. We know it's absolutely undeniable tonight you have already heard and you will continue to hear success stories, statistics proving the economic benefit of the sector and clear examples of successful uh, tourism increases and social benefits of our sector. The stories shared this evening are coming from strong leaders from the arts and heritage sector who are dedicated to improving the lives of all those who live and visit Nelson through direct and indirect engagement. Some of the statistics I wanted to give to you, Sydney has already mentioned, so I won't, in, uh, I won't duplicate that. Um, all that I will say is that we, the last economic impact survey of the arts in Nelson was in 2003, so the numbers that we're presenting to you are quite old. We do know that the sector has grown incredibly and that um, we are all contributing to that success of Nelson as a whole. So given that this evening we are presenting to this council, this particular council, for the first time, I wanted to take the opportunity to clearly present to you and to our public who it is that we are, what is it that we do, and the impacts that we have and will continue to make in this community. I will likely <laughs> brief over this section so that I can really get to the tangibles of 2018, what the grant enabled, 2018 finances, and then also 2019. Uh, we have been in existence from 1955. So Touchstone Nelson Museum has existed as its iteration in since 2006, but the organization since 1955, and we've made incredible impacts in our community. We are relevant, we are essential, we are multifaceted, and this is only growing. We provide a vital service to the city of Nelson and its citizens by housing, maintaining, and growing the archives and history collection representing the immediate area and bringing cutting edge history and art exhibitions to local tourists. We have so many pillars of our work which include outreach to schools, uh, public programs, partnerships with the community, truth and reconciliation, as well as maintaining uh, the 502 Vernon Street site, the interior of the site, as well as now the bunker, the Cold War heritage site that exists in the city of Nelson. So I, um, I have a confession to you. It's likely very clear I am a museum nerd. <laughs> I believe so wholeheartedly in the importance of museums and art galleries around the globe as a means to understanding our world. Without knowing where we come from, we cannot know we are, where we are going. And this is what it is that we do at the museum in part. We house the collection. We keep Nelson and area history alive. We have over 7,000 objects in the collection, 5,000 of which have been photographed and made accessible through a searchable online database. From anywhere in the world, people can learn about Nelson through our collection. The majority of the collection, about 90% of its objects, are from the city of Nelson proper, and roughly 500 objects, which is about less than 10%, are from the RDCK. One of the vision pieces that the board and I have alongside the community will be to work to redevelop the museum space, currently situated on the second floor, to fit with current museological practices, with truth and reconciliation, and with the changing needs of our community. Now, I can go on and on about the archives, but I might just quote Greg Nestor off here. <laughs> it seems like all the solutions to the world's mysteries, or at least Nelson's mysteries, can be found in the Sean Lamb archives. It's one of the first places I look when trying to answer any historical question. So it's so hard to talk about the value of the archives, the incredible, the vast array that we have. We have over you know, 500,000 pages from newspapers, 50,000 Kootenai newspaper issues between 1893 and 2018. It, the list goes on and on. I actually don't have time to, to talk about the, the true essential service that we provide to this community as a result of just housing the archives. But I hope that you'll visit Jean-Philippe Stien, who's the, collections, um, the archivist and collections <coughs> manager there. 
Now, another thing that we do, of course, is exhibitions. We live in a physically isolated community in the interior of BC. It means this is even more essential to bring contemporary and current relevant Canadian art to our community, to share in a national cultural dialogue, and not allow our physical location to lessen any ability to add to Canadian culture, knowledge, and relevancy. We bring exceptional art to this community for not only our citizens, but tourists to the area as well. School and public programs, again, the significance and importance is very challenging to quantify. Of course, we have school numbers and statistics to offer you, but really it's about um, students engaging with contemporary art and history in meaningful ways to inspire next generations, not just of artists, but of critical thinkers and problem solvers. Another aspect of our work, another pillar, is of course collaborations and community engagement. Uh, we continue to partner with new organizations, with um, essentially everyone behind you, you see, we partner with, as well as so many other people in our community, and we will continue to do so more and more throughout. Something we haven't touched about, uh, touched upon too often in uh, this presentation is facility management. What it is that we do for 502 Vernon Street. It's, it's one of the most significant heritage buildings in our community and it's really essential that that building is made accessible to the public as a public site as opposed to for private means. Uh, that anyone who comes to the city comes into that building, hopefully, and uh, those who, uh, who live here can really access the whole space. And we're working to open up the space even more to ensure that the third floor can be renovated um, and we can turn that into an educational site. Local support and economic impact. Again, over and over, we, um, we support so many local artists and artisans through uh, the shop and um, by artist fees that we present to those who are in our region uh, exhibiting in our space. Um, I have phenomenal quotes from artists that I will send to you over email. Uh, again, we are also about volunteerism. We are a community hub. We have so many uh, board members and incredible volunteers who have given uh, their time to us. We have over uh, 3,800 volunteer hours in 2018 and over 75 active volunteers. We have 465 members of our organization, about 85 of whom are from, 85% of whom are from the city of Nelson. 13% from the RDCK and about 2% from around BC and other areas. So let's get into some specifics of 2018. Am I going to run out of time completely? Where am I at? About three minutes. You have about three minutes. In total. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll flip through this. Okay. So 2018, I we did so much in 2018. I mean, it was really quite an incredible year. Um, we have. Um, shifted our focus to ensuring we are bringing in high-level contemporary Canadian artists such as Sunny Asu, Brendan Tang to our community. We're pushing the boundaries a little bit as to what art might be and this is a, a really important aspect of what it is that we do. We're also bringing in uh, exciting exhibitions like the Indigenous Archival <coughs> Photo Project, 402 Anderson Show as well which are history related. I wanted to highlight two, uh, which were community curated, a new direction for us, the She, We, They, The Women's Show, and a mountain bike retrospective. These two shows brought in more people than we've ever seen in the gallery space. We had just 450 people from the opening and closing events of the mountain bike show. This is really about relevancy. We're doing what is essential for the public. We're making sure that uh, we count, and we're doing um, exciting new programs that bring people in the doors. Artists in residency programs really wanting to support the work that the artists in our community do. We've opened up new spaces of our building. I've mentioned the archives, the collection. We continue to grow the archive and collection every year. We receive uh, countless donations from individuals in our community who believe strongly in the democracy of access of historical records. One minute. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to skip through. <laughs> Um, truth and reconciliation is a really important aspect of what we are involved in that we are responding to the calls to action of both UNDRIP and the TRC, ensuring that we can work with regional Indigenous nations to um, really move forward in the way in which we are programming, exhibiting projects. The bunker and collections move. Finally, this project has been underway for so, so many years and it's so exciting to see it come to fruition. It will be opening in the fall of 2019. And um, Mayor Dooley was there. Our mountain bike show, of course, you see some of this beautiful photograph. Our numbers have remained um, 
consistent in their growth and even more so. We continue to bring in so many individuals in our community, both from schools and um, so many other areas. And we, sorry, we just wanna get to our budget. Um, what we're doing in terms of budget this year is really looking to, I'm just gonna take a couple more minutes. Um, what we wanted to make sure is that we are being as fiscally responsible as absolutely possible while ensuring we are balancing between surplus and deficit so that we can make the absolute most impact in our community as possible. We ensure that our contingency funds remain ro robust in case of emergencies. However, we're really wanting to make sure that um, our impact is, is absolutely as big as it possibly can be. In 2018, the grants, which are sitting at 2015 levels, let me just get to my notes, 39% um, of our grant that we receive from the City of Nelson goes towards buildings and utilities. The remaining 61% goes towards salaries. This only covers about 59% of the salaries in total. So all of that other uh, funding comes from different grants. <clears throat> in terms of grants, I wanted to mention that in 2016, we had about 48,000, 2017, 94,000, 2018, 168,000. So from 2018 to 2016, that's an increase of $120,000. We have been working very hard to leverage the money that the City of Nelson allows uh, us every year to increase um, what we're bringing in from the province and from the federal government. In terms of the bunker alone, we have brought in over $310,000 for that project. It's a, an incredible asset for the community now. Let me get to 2019 before we run out of time and I'm kicked out. <laughs> Once we're doing, again, is um, walking the fine line between balance and, uh, we're really balancing between surplus and deficit, ensuring that we are as absolutely close as possible. We're talking about $1,000 surplus, $1,000 deficit, so that we can make absolutely the most impact in our community as possible. I wanted to talk about this number here, $241,400 seems like a very large increase from $223,000. What I wanted to mention is that we are sitting at 2015 levels. Um, if we had received a 2% infl inflation increase every year since then, this is what we would be asking for in 2019. This is really about the fact that we continue to grow and yet when we have, um, we don't receive that increase, the inflation increase, it is in fact a decrease in that we are paying for greater utilities and building maintenance and all of those costs go up and yet the operating fund remains the same. So we are trying our hardest to leverage our earned revenue and our other grants in order to continue to grow sustainably. I have incredible visions and plans, as does the Board of Directors for 2019 and beyond, in terms of what it is that our impact will do. And um, I hope that you've had a chance to look through the PowerPoint, to look through all of that, and then I can answer any questions about our vision moving forward in the shortened question period. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Ask anyone on the CDC, they'll tell you I'm a talker, so. <laughs> okay, so we have um, about seven minutes for questions. Questions? I do. Councillor Runwick. Um, after it, you ran by, sorry, you ran some membership numbers yes. just a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Can you run those again for yes, me? Yes, 85% of our membership is from the City of Nelson proper. Okay. And about 13% of those, 13% uh, of our membership is from the RDCK. Okay. And you house in the archives, you still house. Um, Artists. items from the valley? Our items from the? Uh, items from the Slocan Valley, from the Winla area? So what, um, part of what we've been doing for the last number of years is really looking at the mandate of the organization and of the collection itself. So we have undergone a process of deaccessioning a lot of items, both from the object, uh, the collection, as well as from archives, which ensures that if there is another organization that can house that, they do. And so we've been giving a lot of items to even Vancouver because the, um, the object or the archival information doesn't pertain specifically to Nelson anymore. Uh, so we've been really undergoing that work, but um, we are primarily are housing a lot of um, area E and F in our uh, collection. And I have a whole um, series of numbers that outline exactly how many it is. And it's, it's 500 objects out of 7,000. And in terms of the archives, it's a little harder to um, 
piece together because of course a photograph takes up less room <laughs> than um, a large object and so we are able to house that if we can. Um, some of what we've we've done as well is if an organization or if there isn't an organization or if the organization doesn't have the capacity to house something archival or object related we do keep it so that we ensure it is preserved for posterity it's not something that we will right. discard for example okay. and um, currently you are you are not receiving any funding from the area we are currently a. receiving operational funding from RDCK area E Okay. In the amount of five thousand dollars, so they've given us they gave us five thousand dollars in twenty eighteen for operating funding, with um, as a result of the knowledge that we do house many of their objects and, and archival right. holdings, right. and um, we will be making that same request in twenty nineteen. We also received CIP funding in the in the amount of about five thousand dollars from the various areas, right. mostly area E and area F. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Luttenberg? Um, following up on Councillor Renwick's question about the RDCK's or Area E's contribution of 5,000, as well as the membership of 8%? 13% from RDCK, yep. Is that, it, sorry, I guess I, is that a reasonable number given population, 13%? Uh, that seems low, relatively speaking, is it? Yeah, and I would say that, um, that's a hard question to answer. I would say that the the Nelson, we are, our legal name is the Nelson and, and District Museum. Uh, we are situated in the heart of Nelson. We are really seen as the city of Nelson's museum and archives and collection. We, of course, go a little bit beyond that, but really our area doesn't go, um, you know, all the way up to Caslow even, for example. I mean, there there's really uh, focused on a community hub in the city of Nelson, and I think that we certainly can request from RDCK uh, more participation be it through membership as well as funding and, and that's something that we will be doing in 2019 and beyond um, but I, I do believe that uh, this museum has been so much a heart uh, a part of the heart of the city of Nelson for so long that uh, the citizens here really do love it and see its value and appreciate it yeah no I, I get that I guess 13 percent is a reasonable number I just it would be interesting to know the population differences particularly area E Mm. Yes, and I can um, talk to their directors as well and have a, a conversation about perceived value, which is always a harder thing to, to grasp. But if we're talking about perceived value among their, uh, the RDCK Area E or Area F or <clears throat> what, other area, what other area citizens, then we can certainly get to the bottom of that. Well, because 13% of memberships, um, if that's in any way sort of a, a good goal to, to get in terms of funding from from area E? Well, 5,000 is certainly not 13%. 5,000 from area E is like 2.5% oh. to 3%. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it would certainly be lovely to see that number go up. And I think if we're talking too about objects, um, you know, we have some of the areas have three objects from our collection represented, right? And some have 85 or 95 objects from one area. And so I think that that's really the number that they're looking at as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the great justification. We would certainly love to see greater operating funds and support through CIP from the areas. Yeah. Um, but I believe that that's partly what they're looking at. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any further questions? Um, Astrid, we, we talked uh, when I was at the uh, closing of the uh, on bike ex exhibit, mm -hmm. which was awesome, <clears throat> and we talked about ten potentially having a committee at the whole meeting yes. at the gallery, and um, kind of hoping you you could work with our staff and planning that going forward because it's nice and be good for us to get out to the community a little bit as well. Absolutely, <clears throat> and you have got a terrific space in there to we do would, something like that. We would love to hold it in Gallery A. It would be a lovely space. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank yeah. you very much. Any further questions? Any questions about 2019 vision, for example, that we didn't have a chance um, to get to? May I have a question. Um, Astrid, I was just wondering if you could provide us with a little bit of your vision for 2019. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a, That's a, such a great question. Thank you so yeah, much. Uh, so, um, One minute. <laughs> <laughs> so we have great plans for 2019. Uh, we've received already... Uh, 
$30,000 from Columbia Basin Trust to place a public art piece outside on uh, Vernon Street. We'll be working with the city in order to develop that. Um, we will be looking to um, finish the bunker space, which is going to be absolutely incredible. Uh, we have just received $85,000 from Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, which will help to complete that project, ensure that our collection is preserved in uh, museum quality standards. And there's also an exhibition going to be developed for the space for the public to come in and visit particularly I think will be very interesting for school programming mm -hmm. and then we also now have two, uh, new staff we have uh, someone dedicated solely to school programming as well as public programming to ensure that we can grow those programs because that's essential in terms of community outreach and wanting to see our school numbers go up um, they've been fairly consistent with a little bit of a drop in 2018 because we cancelled one of our programs. We cancelled the First Nations tour because it wasn't meeting TRC calls to actions. And we've also hired an Indigenous educator, Tony Appleby, to enact those programs. <coughs> Sorry, Astrid. That's okay. Thank you so Thank much you for so your much. time. I Thank greatly you appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, we are still on time. And the next uh, presenter will be the Capitol Theatre. Susan Kurtz, and I'm a member of the board of the Capitol Theater, and with me is Stephanie Fisher, our executive director. I don't know if there's any other board, room, board members here. I don't think so. Um, in this presentation tonight, we will report on some of the projects and programs we undertook in 2017 and 2018. I'm a huge supporter of heritage restoration and bringing buildings to life again. I certainly love this historic image of the Capitol and wanted to share it with you. The Capitol was built in 1927. Since this photo was taken in the 70s, the Capitol has come a long way from almost being demolished to being restored and celebrating its 30th anniversary season in 2018. Mm. We produced an incredible, uh, successful gala event, which added to our year and positive position. I would like to thank the artists who performed free of charge and the audience and donors who supported this fundraiser and support members who organized it. No, Last year we added more programming and shows and received more project funding, which is reflected in our revenues. Specifically through higher income from performances in comparison to last year. Our revenues have surpassed the $500,000 mark. The increase in performances, the gala and increased ticket sales contributed to an increase in revenue of 57,000 over last year. The city's operational funding amounts to 13% of our total revenues and staff wages are 150,000. Building, maintenance, utilities, and high-speed internet amount to 56,000. The related, the related expenses have been managed extremely well, which resulted in a positive position of 32,000 at year's end. As well, our building maintenance expenditures decreased due to substantial renovations and upgrades to our technical equipment we have undertaken over the last five years of we approximately spent uh, 600,000 in uh, renovations. The revenues will, like last year's revenues will be used to match funding 
uh, for the last round of renovations and set aside for unexpected expenses building towards a contingency fund. The Seattle staff is an incredible team and altogether we managed 135 shows as well as outreach, community programming and 150 volunteers. Three of our long serving staff retired in 2018 and we hired new staff. And of course, as you see in this image, Sean Machamber is not part of our team, but we had a fun time hanging out with him. Our staff still doesn't get paid the average wage that is paid in other communities. To reach this goal, we have been slowly increasing our rental fees and online theater improvement fees to ensure that we can continue a 2 to 1 percent wage increase. However, the mentioned increases don't quite cover the wage increases. We know that our rental fees are still very affordable compared to other theaters in the region. The Capitol Theater has revised its five-year strategic plan. Notably, the board has added indigenous engagement to the plan. We love when magic happens on our stage. Last year, we had an increase of 11 shows and served 29,500 patrons in the theater. And in addition, in our outreach programs, of course, we served uh, uh, 1,500 people. Thanks to your financial support and in trusting us, oh, are we going here? Thanks for your financial support and in trusting us to deliver arts and culture services for Nelson. As you can see in the slide, your funding offsets a variety of theater related expenses. Funding from all levels of government, fundraising and earned revenue support our programming and projects and funds some of our operating expenses. We continue to upgrade the facility and our technical equipment and receive funding to the tune of 175000 <coughs> last year. One more oh, sentence. For coming you. up in 2019 is the replacement of the fire panels and upgrades to the fire suppression system. We had a nerve wracking August with no seats in the theater. After restoration and reupholstery, they are back and installed on new flooring. The work was accomplished two weeks ahead of schedule thanks to Cornerstone Construction, our techs and volunteers. And of course, for us as a nonprofit organization, city funding is essential to our, we achieve our service delivery and match funding from other levels. We have many long-time partners and supporters, and I would like to thank them all for their donations. And a special thank goes to our volunteers who run the front of house and assist with productions. They contributed around 4,000 hours to our operations. <coughs> we are proud to offer professional live theater to the community by bringing in artists from BC, Canada, and the US and overseas. Tickets in our family series are very affordable and we are <coughs> working on strategies to attract more young families to the theater. We support the series with project funding and earned revenues to ensure it's, accept it's accessible to all. We continue our relationship with the Nelson Overture Concert Society who is programming high caliber classical music. And we had fun producing five events downtown at Lakeside Park and at the station to celebrate Canada 150 plus, as well as two celebration events. The Sinai celebration packed the house with 380 people. 115 lakes people came up from the Colville Reservation in Washington and other places. The Asian Culture Celebration was a production 
in collaboration with Touchstones and Diana Morita Cole. It was colorful and lots of fun. Two minutes. We continue to build an audience for our performance on screen series. We are a theater for all ages and a place where enthusiastic young dancers take to the stage. We offer a great selection of professional touring shows that inspire and challenge our audience. And we take care of a facility that is accessible to everyone. The Community Pantomime is a staple production and fundraiser for the capital. And still 31 years later, we have around 90 people audition. And each year, we sell out the house for us. This is true family engagement and outreach. Quite a few months, quite a few youth who were enrolled in the summer youth program over the years have moved on to work in theatre or the creative industry. Amongst them are people like Thomas Middleditch, Sarah Allen, Alison Gervin, Adriana Bogart, Oscar Dirks, to name a few. With tears in our eyes, we said goodbye to Jeff, Alison and Lynette who retired from their mentor position after 15 years of running the theater intensive. We continue building our community engagement through workshops and other fun events. They are very well received by the community, the schools and other partners. More operating funding would increase our capacity to offer more outreach by adding a part-time staff. Last year, we started to use off-site uh, spaces for performances to showcase theatre and music outside the theatre walls. Fireworks Community Choir engaged 350 singers with an audience of 650 who were deeply touched by the performance. This event took place in the hockey arena. So that's 10 minutes. Okay, I need a little bit more, two minutes. Um, Theatre for Living's play Home Reconciliation from Inside Out was staged at LVR and drew an audience of 380. Our funding request for 2019 is an increase of 4% as we are experiencing cost increases in artist fees, travel costs, accommodation fees, and other expenses. We are keeping expenses as low as possible, however we have no control over some of the increases. An increase will also support an increase in staff wages, which I think is essential in keeping a highly motivated and dedicated staff team. This year, we expanded our community engagement by adding an after-school theater program for youth age 6 to 8 and 9 to 12, as well as a spring uh, break theater intensive for youth, for youth uh, 13 to 18. And we have again applied for project funding to tackle the final phase of renovations, which will include the scenery shop, washrooms, and the costume shop. This will set up the theater for the foreseeable future. We're always available by email, phone, and through our website. And running a live performance art theater programs and projects is complex, so I'm waiting for your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, we have about nine minutes for questions. Councillor Page. Thanks, Stephanie, for uh, giving that great presentation. And Susan, um, my first question was looking at these numbers for revenue, yeah, the performances. How, how have the performances been bringing in compared to previous years? Ticket sales. Um, I think we were up around $25,000 the last year over the year before mm -hmm. yeah, yeah bef because we had also more performances than right. the year before and do you have any sense of 2016 uh, no I don't have the numbers <laughs> no, I just want to I want to get a trend <laughs> Council Lottenberg yeah <clears throat> thank you um, thank you for that presentation mm -hmm. uh, I didn't hear anything about beyond your, your vision beyond uh, the current upgrades to the theater like do you have vision to upgrade expand the the uh the capital in other yeah, ways yeah definitely um uh 
doing more outreach programming, like with introducing more theater intensives for the younger children, mm -hmm. is one of the of the programs we are starting to tackle. Like we have to run a program for one year before we can apply to BC Gaming to actually get funding for the program. So right now we are running those two programs. They are called Footlights and Spotlight. And then we hope that next year we can apply for funding to make those larger and an ongoing event. Mm. Do you have any plans to the building itself, like to the facility to expand? No? Yeah, we are, we are right now we are doing a feasibility study okay. on um, looking into uh, building a 125-seat black box theater. So we are just finished the second focus group. Mm -hmm. and we are we will have some interviews and there will be a survey to the communities there are different stakeholders so if we can confirm that there is actually a need for a second performance space mm -hmm. that would be very flexible like a black box mm -hmm. which means it could be used for all kinds of events like it's not only theater but it could be a rehearsal space a meeting place whatever you want to do um then we would look into like starting that project which will probably a pro be a project like five years out right like three to five years Okay, well, that's that's great. I, I wanted mm -hmm. to get a sense of your ambition so that mm -hmm. when you're asking for more, and granted that it's not a, a big ask and there's certain inflationary pressures that you're facing, it's nice to hear when our arts community is thinking, thinking bigger and thinking uh, more in terms of, you know, evolving mm -hmm. the sector. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, as we heard from all the other presenters, um, I definitely also think that the arts community is growing in town and uh, it's important to like really support and maintain um, the the arts community because we are all non-profits we uh, don't get paid a lot of money and we we have huge volunteerism mm -hmm. and lots of our staff people put in a lot of volunteer work too mm -hmm. to make organizations run mm -hmm. uh, smoothly <coughs> such as Oxygen Art Center yeah. who are a player in the, in the field. Great, thank you. Councilor Runrick. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, Yeah. first off, best AGM I've ever been to Beer and chocolate, free, beautiful, <laughs> it was fantastic. Secondly, um, I'm just looking at your financials and mm -hmm. I'm asking this question tonight because several reasons, but <clears throat> I'm gonna ask about the regional district because there's four of us sitting at this table that pay taxes into the regional district yeah. and we're wondering where those tax dollars go. Yeah. And so <laughs> you budgeted for thir about $33,000. Uh, you have federal, provincial and regional district and your actual was about 73,000. Do you, can you give me a rough breakdown on that? Like how much, do you know how much the RD is contributing? So the RDCK area, Ira Mona Faust, like yes. she contributed $5,000 again. She did that uh, last year too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is great. I've been in conversation with uh, Area F with Tom Newell and to talk about um, the, in general, the cultural sector in Nelson and the region and what would be a good approach to really make a, a strong argument to the regional district to support the entire sector. So I think this will be uh, conversations that we will have as a cultural sector amongst each other and hopefully working towards an approach to the regional district in some way, shape or form. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So we all have to figure out how many 
uh, people are actually coming from the regional district to our facilities. Like we know it's quite a few, like mm -hmm. depending on the show we have, like we could have half a house of people coming in from the Slocan Valley, for example. Mm -hmm. So really an approach to the all the regional district directors and starting with a presentation on what we do, I think would be a good step to go. I agree. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Mayor Dooley? Um, sticking with the beer topic that was brought up, um, <laughs> I often wonder why the theater didn't allow, didn't try and get sales on the expanding the lobby. I know when I go to the Capitol, I love to go between in, in the intermission and have a beer, but you got to get it down so fast and like you're jammed in that uh, front. Yeah. It probably is a hindrance to profits. Um, um, yeah, it, it is. I mean, we are not like a drinking venue. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, I have a lot of friends. Like a lot of friends will go, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if we were drinking, you could, you can come, you can come like an I hour. Increase, I you guarantee, can, yeah, I can increase those numbers. Yeah, you can come an hour before the show and <laughs> <laughs> have a good time. Um, beer garden on the street. Beer garden on the street. Um, I've been looking into uh, with a, like our liquor license is very strict because we also have uh, children in mm -hmm. the theater. So we have a very specific liquor license that has been grandfathered in, like, I don't know how many years ago, <coughs> but way before my time. So if, if we would change that, like if we would expand that, like we would have to apply to a whole new liquor license. And I know that the liquor licensing has uh, changed their policies, and I will have to really explore that with uh, mm -hmm. Jim Booth, like the guy here in Nelson, who does the liquor license process, and see what we could do. We do allow for certain events to have liquor uh, in the back of the theater. Yeah, that's what I was mm -hmm. So we have some, some music events or some other mm -hmm. events where we do that, and some we are talking about maybe uh, maybe after a performance that we open up uh, the bar again yeah. for like half an hour so that people can hang out, process uh, yeah. kind of performance, have a glass of wine, and then go. But I also know we had a survey. Uh, I know that 50% of our customers or patrons go either before or after a show, either for dinner or a drink. All right, we're going to have to call it there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're still right on time. Uh, the next uh, presenter will be the Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. Tom, you notice people are leaving. Okay. <laughs> 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 no reason for that. <laughs> Talk about staying on time. <laughs> Quick, get out of here. Yeah. Okay. Chocolate's Thought I should get some water because one of the times I was doing this, I had to get water from Councillor McDonald. I've been doing these so long that it was back in the days when Councillor McDonald was still there. So <laughs> she graciously offered me her water. So thank you very much, everybody. Make sure we're clicking this thing correctly. I'm Tom Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce, and this is Valley Yoak. She's the Visitor Center Manager, and the Chamber of Commerce has been uh, operating the Visitor Center on a fee-for-service contract uh, for a number of years. I've been working at the Chamber since 2007, and it was long before that that the Chamber was uh, offering the service. Primarily, it was uh, you know, a City of Nelson uh, function, 
that probably is one of the reasons why we haven't got any re regional district funding. It's always been a city of Nelson uh, function, but we're trying to work with the regional district down the road to see if we can get some funding from them as well. If you look at uh, what visitor centers are designed to do, many destinations are under the belief that once a visitor has arrived, the job is complete and the economic benefits will just flow. They'll go onto their internet, they'll book their flights, they'll come to your community, they'll drive to your community, but once they get there, what do they do? Quite often you'll still see people using phones, but there's a number of people that come in and want to have that face-to-face -face contact with a person, and whether that's here at the visitor center that, that we run, or if it's at a local bar talking to a, uh, a server, talking to a friend or relative, they want that individual face-to-face -face contact, and I think that's one of the services that we really provide. Attracting the new visitors is really just the start of the program. Once they arrive, they want to be super served, and they want to find out, you know, what do you have to offer, why would we come here, and why should we stay more than one day? And that's one of the things that our staff has really, really been good at over the years. Uh, they're doing that, here's the first impression, giving you the best of what we have to offer not just in Nelson but throughout the area and we do try to share them right around the entire region and they act as welcoming ambassadors for the entire region and we think that the visitor center that we have in Nelson is ideal we moved into that building in 2015 after a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat and labor and a lot of sleepless nights but we think right now it's a great way to uh, begin your experience in Nelson if you're stopping in. It's at the confluence of two major highways coming into town and a far better location than where we were when we were down at 225 Hall Street. So Val and the staff, they do a tremendous job of creating that remarkable experience. Uh, the value, lifetime value of a visitor is really uh, something that you, you take for granted. You think, well, a person comes to your community one time and what are they going to do? They're going to stay, they're going to go to a go to a couple of restaurants, they're going to go shopping, they're going to go to a show, they go do some outdoor adventures, and then they're gone. But the longer you can keep them in the community, the better it is for your economic development and the better it is for all of the businesses. And that obviously helps those businesses stay successful. So we're a visitor center, but we're also a marketing center. I think we continue to market the entire area. We talk to people when they come in about all of the shops and services, the amenities, the attractions, and we also talk about uh, provincial tourism products. So when people come to Nelson, they're not just staying in Nelson, they'll sometimes be on their way to Rossland or to Castle Guard, a trail, or perhaps throughout the rest of the southern interior. And they're not just coming <coughs> for one day. It's their job, and Val takes a very seriously to try to get those folks to stay in the community longer. What is it that you want to do? How can we help you? And some people think it's a one day trip. After Val and the staff have uh, finished talking to them, they quite often will stay three and four days. And others will say, we're gonna come back again next year because we didn't realize there were so many things to do in this community. So we've got about a- Sorry, Tom, I was gonna to add to that, please. Val wants to add something to that, so carry on, Val. Jump in, Val. You need to get the microphone as close as possible. Please. Thank you. Um, our, right our team enjoys uh, w uh, having the opportunity to meet people from all over the world on a daily basis. Uh, we take time to engage in conversation to find out where they're from, how long they're staying, and what are their interests. From this information, we formulate <coughs> a plan, suggest op op uh, activities, places to eat, and of course, see our downtown amenities. Often people on holidays want to try something different, so we encourage them to try something like whitewater rafting, zip lining, ride the streetcar, see the museum, and take in um, theater. Um, different things and we try to stay current on local events to share with our visitors to try something different and unique uh, we just had a family visiting from Nelson New Zealand of, uh, three children here for about six weeks why don't you try this night skiing at the Nordic the moonlight ski so here they are they've never tried night skiing headlights tiki torches it's like being on survivor it's something very exciting um, they uh, had cider, marshmallows, cl climbed in the cabin, came back. The father said, this was the most memorable experience I will take with me to be able to do this with my family. Um, our team enjoys getting out and trying new things, which in turn we share with our visitors all the great things there is to do in our area. And we also encourage our visitors to um, use Discover Nelson, City of Nelson website, Nelson Community Tourism. 
So during the course of uh, while you're working there, 365 days a year, minus a few, uh, we become a crisis center as well. So we're a visitor center, but people call a visitor center for all sorts of weird things. <laughs> they can be weird, <laughs> but they can also be really concerning. You know, things like fires and floods and things like that that have caused uh, people to maybe stay away for any length of time. It's our job to try to let them know the truth, but also let them know that there's still things that they can do while they come to the community, despite the fact that there's fire and there's other situations okay. that are happening. I was going to add to that. Um, we stay on top of current situations with regards to road conditions, as Tom said, fires, floods, and avalanche risks, ferry schedules. Um, we encourage our visitors to check the, the appropriate websites to make sure that they're safe when traveling over the passes, maybe to take alternate routes or if roads are closed. Um, uh, we've been recently uh, fielding calls of people with regards to Greyhound. How do I get to Nelson? How do I leave Nelson? Uh, and very concerned people as to <coughs> what are the options. We also answer local information requests such as garbage pickup, bus schedules, seniors needing help. I don't know how to use a computer, help me. And business contacts. So, so everything. everything. I have your phone number. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> so you can talk about info on the go. And so um, we also, uh, every summer, we hire uh, student, uh, summer students. And uh, we tend to see most of our visitors from the months of June through September. In mid-May, we contact local businesses, accommodations, restaurants, adventure outfitters, inviting them to invite us on a familiarization tour. This gives businesses an opportunity to showcase their products, their services, and what they do. Also, we have a really good time, and we get to see what businesses offer. Um, another service we offer is Info on the Go. You may have seen our white tent up on Baker Street. Um, Jesse at the uh, Farmer's Market on Wednesdays. We offer information services to locals and visitors, which is a great service to have people out because sometimes they don't make it to our visitor center. And of course, um, there was a photo of our team down at Canada Day. Uh, Two minutes. Which the chamber uh, puts on every year. And visitor centers come from all areas, but essentially the majority of our visitors are regional visitors um, and within British Columbia. And then there's people coming in from Europe, Washington, and other parts of Canada. Alberta, surprisingly, is still relatively strong, but uh, I think the majority of Albertans tend to go into the Columbia Valley and not mm. as many coming to this neck of the woods as, as mm. we have seen in the past. And our numbers, Val, uh, up and down, but they've certainly been impacted uh, in the last couple of years by uh, some of the fire situations. For the month of August, uh, we fielded many calls from visitors concerned about the fire situation. The hype from the media as BC is burning um, created a lot of concern. Um, so we were honest with our visitors as to where the fire locations were, and on a day-to-day -day basis, the smoke situation would change. So we would offer them alternate, uh, alternate activities. Um, some guests would cancel, some guests stayed, um, it varied. Uh, we had some mountain bikers who had left because of the smoke situation from Italy. They said, well, we can go back to Italy and ride. Uh, it was kind of ironic. Another Italian gentleman walked in at the same time, he said, I don't care. I smoke. Doesn't bother me. <laughs> so. <laughs> <Probably right here>. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a fee for service contract, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And this chamber has been operating the visitor center for a number of years. Uh, we've been operating around seventy-six thousand dollars in an annual fee for service contract with the city of Nelson since two thousand and seven. Uh, that's when I started. Um, so seventy-six thousand dollar contribution from the city of Nelson works out to about thirty-one dollars and thirty cents per hour in twenty eighteen. So it's fairly. So, sorry, it's ten minutes. So other people had moved into their a little bit into their questioning time. So you could do that if you want. It's darn near finished. Okay. So we're basically uh, operating at around seventy-six thousand dollars a year from the city. There's been no increase since two thousand and seven, and we're asking for a small two percent inflationary increase this year if. Uh, 
So a lot of the things that we wind up providing a vibrant and welcoming uh, Heritage Regional Visitor Center uh, community hub for artisans to showcase their product. We've expanded our hours over the last couple of years, 200 additional hours to go into the shoulder seasons, uh, comprehensive community and regional tourism and business information, as well as Kootenai Rockies and around the province. We have year-round staffing and trained visitor center counselors and public washrooms and free visitor Wi-Fi internet access. The program that we started last year and will continue to build are Nelson Ambassadors. They're a volunteer group of business people and community members providing extra eyes on the street and to provide some visitor services and Val rolled out a pilot on behalf of Destination BC. So it's our goal this year to continue to offer the ambassador program with new staff in the business community because we feel it's essential that um, staff have knowledge of the community, you engage in conversation, people find out more about the community and they in turn want to stay longer. So essentially in our budget, our net operating income is around $122,000 for the visitor center. Our operating expenses of the visitor center are $151,000 and we don't charge ourselves rent. Our excess expense over income is about $28,000. So the Chamber of Commerce uh, subsidizes the visitor center to the tune of twenty five dollars to $35,000 a year annually. This past year was around $28,000 uh, pending our final external review by our, by our accountant. So our building is a visitor center, of course, but it's also a great community space, and we're hoping to continue to build on that. Uh, things like the uh, the car show and, and bicycle races and that sort of thing, starting from there. And we're soon going to be the home to the Nelson uh, Innovation Center, which is a tech-focused innovation center. And I think you'll be hearing more about that a little later on this evening. So really uh, not a lot more to add other than what we've already told you. Um, we represent the, the Chamber of Commerce represents hundreds of businesses. They employ thousands of individuals of, and, uh, in Nelson and throughout the surrounding area. And those businesses, employees, visitors, and of course the Chamber of Commerce, thank you for your ongoing support of visitor services here in this community. Thank you very much. Um, so we have about eight minutes for questions. Any questions? Councillor Lautenberg. Um, thanks for that presentation. I, uh, it's going to be a theme, I think, tonight. I didn't notice in your, in your, um, in your financial uh, statements anything, any contribution from the RDCK. No, as long as I've been doing this, uh, Councillor Lautenberg, there's been no contributions other than one or two years where we've got some discretionary funding from somebody. Mm -hmm. um, one time from Area E, one time from Area F. And it's not ongoing, even though there's a number of regional businesses that uh, we share the people around the region. There's no question that the regional district is uh, should be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Renwick, did you know? No, I knew the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Could you, Tom? Could you speak a little bit to uh, where the visitor center is going? This has been operating a little bit at a loss for a while and and there's some there's some direction maybe to to rejuvenate it you've got the tech center coming in there is there is there some vision into how to bring this into the red or bring this into the black uh, visitor centers are challenging to operate in a city uh, whether it's nelson or whether it's anywhere else in the province uh, we're not we don't receive any funding from uh, regional district as we spoke we get about eighteen thousand dollars from the province to operate and be part of the provincial visitor center network uh, we're fortunate in the time that I've been with the chamber that we've grown our own membership so we've grown our membership considerably since 2007 so that helps the chamber itself operate a visitor center but I don't think that there's anybody that's as fiscally responsible or we're certainly near the top of the list as far as fiscally responsible organizations go we look for uh, ways of keeping our costs under control there's not a huge vision to say what can we do to make it any better uh, other than continuing to provide a service that we feel is beneficial and then to work with the city and, and staff and councillors to find a way of getting this included in other regional discussions. So if there are regional discussions regarding uh, other funding opportunities where the city contributes and the RDCK is not as actively involved, then we'd like to be a part of those discussions. And just a follow-up question, um, maybe for my own clarity. So is it the city of Nelson or the chamber that's subsidizing that, that visitor center right now? Like where's that 28,000? Uh, the 
Chamber of Commerce uh, pays the extra $28,000. Okay, so when the Chamber picks up more revenue and is able to carry more members, it's able to carry that. So yeah, it's, exactly. it's been more, it's been beneficial to us. You know, we haven't received any extra funding from the city. So we have to find ways of making sure that we're mitigating those costs. Right. Uh, we've basically been working with the same staffing level since 2007. Uh, we increased one person by a point through, uh, I guess it's about a point seven five, uh, added 24 hours to, uh, to our workload to help take the workload off of these guys during the course of the year. And then we get a little, we also apply for funding to uh, the Canada Summer Youth Pro or Summer Program for uh, from the federal government. And the Columbia Basin Trust provides about $5,000 a year to help hire a summer student as well. So okay. we keep our costs relatively low. Um, you know, you talk about, is there a vision to try to fix it? You know, I think the chamber wants to become, if we can become uh, fiscally self-sustainable. Um, we do have a building that we have a mortgage on that we're continuing to pay down, but we're doing that on a, a fairly consistent basis and we're hoping to continue to generate revenue from the from the building itself which can go back into offsetting the cost of running the visitor center you know and another thing is if somebody else took it over and started leasing us leasing that space um, we'd probably be in a better financial position as a chamber of commerce but I'm not sure whether the visitor center would be any better off because right now we don't charge anybody we don't charge ourselves rent right councillor Moore I'm sorry Councilor Morrison. So just a question, um, Tom, in terms of, you talked about how from the province there's uh, 18,000 that comes from, yeah. Um, and I know that um, having had this discussion maybe with you before, I, and I just don't know where it has been over the last few years, in terms of Destination BC and all of the changes that they've made in their programming and the fact that there's always been this concern about um, some some select areas in the province get a, a, a substantive um, grant uh, from Destination BC, and particularly like, uh, I mean, well, if you know, but other communities, and, and the one that comes to my mind that's sort of more like Nelson than any of them is the fact that like Osuyas has that major um, gateway uh, visitors information center. And is there any movement or any thought at that level of organization at, at the government that they're looking at other potential gateways or whatever we want to call those those hub um, VIC centers and sort of spreading the wealth a little bit? There has been no major movement on any of those. As a matter of fact, they're actually backing off on some of those big gateways, mm -hmm. providing less funding and having a private sector contract. So, All right. I guess with the exception of having a grow up in the basement. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, just, it's just a shame, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a couple minutes. Anybody left? Rick? Um, one of the, the visitor centers that I love uh, is in Squamish. I'm not sure if you've been to the one in Squamish, Vic. It's, it's really good. And, and one of the things I think, and don't quote me on this, but I think they do pretty well. They have two things that stood out for me. Number one is they've got a great cafe um, that I think the visitor center there operates and, and gets funding. It doesn't look like we get funding from our cafe, do we? It doesn't look like in the financials. Not into the visitor center itself. So the building is owned by the Chamber of Commerce right. and the Chamber of Commerce gets revenue from tenants and they... they so that's they a separate pay, tenant. That's a separate tenant. It's not okay. necessarily self-contained. When our architect came in and designed that space, they said this could be a restaurant, it could be a cafe. It could be an interpretive center, or it could be just bigger part of the visitor center. So it became. It looks like it's part of the visitor center, but it's a standalone private sector okay. business. That was okay. Because because one of the things that's great about the Squamish visitor center in it, the cafe is is great. They've got gelato and stuff. So a lot of people just go to the visitor center for for the gelato. To be honest, and then there's um, a big area there where you can plan your stay. Like it's spread out and, and, and people gather for like, especially before they're going on tour, it'll, they often gather at the visitor center to plan like an expedition. So you'd have like eight people with maps laid out and stuff like that. And it creates a really cool vibe. It's also got a big theater. And I know that's probably not something you could do now, but I found that was pretty good. It was like a pretty powerful introduction to the area. But the thing that stood out, I think most- Sorry, Councilor Lundberg, we do have to- We have to go? Yeah. Is, I'll just say this. Um, uh, they have a bike rental 
zone outside and so having like an electric bike rental might be a, a good thing to consider too to get people zoom around the city from the visitor center. We're open to those ideas. We're also doing a lot of public art and uh, we do have an electronic kiosk that's uh, just a new one got put in there by Smart One Technologies but it's being it's a work in progress so we'd like to be able to provide 24 hour uh, seven day a week services uh, by when we're not there people can still get the information they're looking for. So some of those technologies are out there and we're trying to pursue them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so um, we're still, uh, we're just one minute over time, but we're still moving along well. Uh, the next presenter is the Nelson and Area Economic Development. I think that's a perfect fit. Yeah, it'd be great. Partnership. <laughs> partnership, sorry, economic partnership. There's like Jeff's could run it on contract. Electric's back. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Haven't seen you in a while, Tom. Hey, nice to see you. <laughs> All right, so are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Um, I'm, again, I'm Tom Thompson with the Chamber of Commerce, Andrea Wilkie, Executive Director of uh, Community Futures of Central Kootenai. Uh, we're gonna have a presentation on the Nelson and Area Economic Development Partnership, some of the partnership structure for some of the new councillors that uh, haven't been uh, around for the last number of years. Uh, the 2018-2020 strategic priorities, also some key achievements and some strategic goals. And we'll also talk a little bit about the budget, which was also included as part of your uh, package that was given to you about a week ago. So our area has a lot of key employers. So key employers in the Nelson area, about 1,300 business licenses in the city of Nelson. That was in 2018, generated about $180,000 in license revenue annually, and approximately 25% of all taxation in the city comes from the businesses in this community so obviously it's very important to have a strong and vibrant business community so the economic development partnership is an arrangement where parties agree to cooperate to advance mutual interest towards economic development so we're not considered to be receiving a grant as far as we're aware the city of Nelson and the RDCK are partners in the economic development partnership uh, back in 2005 when this partnership was formed essentially uh, all of the parties were brought into a room Community Futures was doing a certain level of uh, economic development, the Chamber was doing some, the City wanted to do some, and had uh, not necessarily the staffer to do it. So that partnership was developed at that time, so it's working as three equal and uh, equal partners. And now there's, then the City of Nelson uh, was the original founding member, and then the RDCK was brought in in 2010 to include area E and F. So we have uh, Councillor Lokenberg and uh, Kevin Cormack as part of the uh, coordinating committee uh, for the Economic Development Partnership, also Ramona Faust and Tom Newell. And then from Community Futures, we have our past chair, Bob Wright, and Andrea Wilkie here, and myself and Tanya Finley, who's a local business owner. That's part of the coordinating committee. They meet on a monthly basis and help move the strategic priorities forward to the best of our abilities. And then there's a quarterly meeting of an advisory committee and it's made up of a broad cross-section of the community including uh, people from the Kootenai Co-op and there's a person from Pacific Insight and DHC Communications, Home Hardware, Kootenai Career Development and Kootenai Lake Tourism as well as uh, Cameron Whitehead who's also in the back behind us uh, from the Kootenai Association of Science and Technology and uh, the partners from the political spectrum as well. Do you want to take a little bit of look at the strategic priorities for 2018-2020? Andrea? Am I jumping in? Yes, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, so every year the advisory committee hosts a st strategic planning session. So um, in 2017 we created a brand new strategic planning session and we set that for 2018 to 2020. Uh, so that's informed by feedback from the advisory committee. We typically do a bit of a survey about issues and opportunities before that happened. And then we also look at business retention and expansion research. So the themes that emerge for 2018 to 2020 continue to be business retention and expansion, so keeping our existing businesses successful, uh, continuing to focus on building our digital economy, and then two new topics that emerge were workforce, so helping our employers have the staff they need to do the jobs they need them to do, and housing uh, with a specific link to housing and how it's impacting our local economy and workforce. The other topics we identified um, are as follows. And so typically there's, there's topics that emerge. Uh, we can't tackle all of them. 
Um, but these are definitely themes that we want to recognize and have on our radar and identify as areas we want to support. So transportation and how that's affecting our local economy, um, thinking about airport, highway, uh, et cetera. Social development, so poverty reduction, our downtown area, and then the transition to the legal cannabis economy. So those were all things we identified as uh, important things that we wanted to support as much as we could. So in terms of achievements from the past year, from a business retention and expansion perspective, um, here it highlights a couple of the actions we wanted to focus on, and really this is about helping businesses access capital, um, as well as adopting technology. And in terms of outcomes we saw over the last year, so the West Kootenai Boundary Community Investment Co-op was uh, incorporated on December 31st uh, with 95 members. And so what that is, is it's a new uh, investment pool where local investors can put their money into this pool, which will then be invested into local businesses. The nice thing with that is what, what we see is that when you invest local dollars in local businesses, people are that much more likely to support them. Uh, the other thing we saw is through our Community Futures Training Center, we, we uh, sought to help businesses adopt technology. So offering courses like uh, Google Apps, Shopify, helping businesses get their um, online store set up is helping businesses adopt technology. Another um, a bit of advocacy success is the new version of the Basin Business Advisor Program that's funded by Columbia Basin Trust now has an emphasis on, on helping businesses adopt technology. Um, and I think that's partly influenced by the themes that we saw coming out of Nelson and some of the pilots we did here. Um, in order to help businesses with their productivity, um, we had six businesses in the region pilot a, a producti productivity assessment tool, um, and the Chamber continues to do its great work around uh, buy local, shop local campaigns. From a digital economy perspective, our goal was to strengthen our digital economy and also be recognized as a top seven intelligent community by 2020. Um, and in terms of outcomes we saw over the last year or so, Probably our biggest win is the fact that Traction On Demand is coming to Nelson in spring 2019, uh, anticipating creating about 20 jobs initially. Uh, so we see that as a huge win um, from the work that's happened over the last few years. Another thing we've identified is that our community needs help with providing access to technology and equal access to technology. So another piece of good news is that our library as well as our youth center applied for funding through Columbia Basin Trust to increase access to uh, tech tools as well as training and they were both shortlisted to continue on with those applications so uh, it's looking favorable that we'll have more equipment available in our community and more tra training to support that. Um, our city continues to expand uh, broadband in the community and also expanded the colo uh, and uh, Nelson in partnership with Castlegar Trail and Rosslyn applied for provincial funding to develop a transportation app for uh, to use data to um, help with uh, safe travel and smart travel, and we were successful with that. So Selkirk College is taking the lead on developing that, but just another win around our digital economy piece. So workforce capacity obviously is something that uh, we want to make sure that we've got adequate supply of uh, workers for this region, and some of the things that we've been working towards is a liaison with the school district and uh, Selkirk College understand the skills training curriculum to make sure that it's lining up with what the uh, current employer needs are then understand that current labor pool demographics where there's some certainly some challenges in the next little while coming up uh, as people start to retire and we need more people to be filling some of those jobs and we might not be able to do that unless we're aligned properly and start to recruit people from outside of the area as well and we wanted to host a career day or a promote a hundred mile career path to promote education and career paths within the region so we have been having ongoing roundtable discussions with the school district and Selkirk College, making sure that those alignments are there. And if there's not an alignment, how do we make sure that that alignment is gonna take place? We've hosted workshops with the Industry Training Authority of the province, uh, Selkirk College School District 8, and trying to promote trades within the area. And building on the manufacturing labor market uh, project that we did in 2017, uh, just a follow-up is being uh, developed by uh, Kootenai Career Development. Uh, one, in light of what's gone on with uh, the manufacturing sector at uh, Pacific Insight to support those workers, but also to identify other things that we can be doing to try to bolster the manufacturing sector to ensure that some of those issues don't happen again. And uh, about 2,000 jobs were searched for uh, in Nelson through the Imagine Kootenai in a year to date. So we've got an Imagine Kootenai slide coming up a little later on. So there's some positive things that are going on in the community as far as workforce, but there's also some uh, 
trends that we need to be concerned about down the road. And housing, we've been a, a strong advocate for all types of housing projects uh, through the area, whether that be affordable housing or assisted living housing. Uh, we're trying to identify barriers and develop some incentives for builders if necessary to provide some workforce housing. So one minute left. So we've been working closely with developers and builders and uh, talking about some of those opportunities that might be there. Uh, lots of great uh, housing projects that are coming on stream. Uh, lots of housing starts in 2018 and uh, about 200 units that are on the books for 2019 in Nelson only. So I think I'll just skip through this in the interest of time, but just to share, we do keep a report card to track our stats. In terms of priorities for the upcoming year, business retention and expansion, something new, is helping our businesses have continuity plans in place should we be affected by a natural disaster. Uh, we've rolled workforce housing into an item under business retention and expansion. Uh, I'm going to zip through this. Uh, building our digital economy, we are going to apply for intelligent community recognition again this summer with the hopes of being recognized in 2020. Um, we're looking forward to launching the Innovation Centre in the upcoming year and continuing to support businesses to access uh, technology. So we'll continue to develop uh, workforce needs and see if we can align the demographic uh, aging with uh, new people coming on and it's really difficult to get through a <laughs> 20 minute uh, presentation when you've got an hour's worth yeah. of information. <laughs> So we'll just continue to work on all of the advocacy areas that we talked about earlier. Uh, transition to the cannabis sector, I think, is something that's really uh, near and dear to the Chamber's heart and also to the Economic Development uh, Partnership to make sure that uh, it's done properly and uh, locals are able to continue to be involved in that organization and uh, that industry. We won't even talk about investment and workforce attraction, even though it's extremely important to the area. The Imagine Kootenai uh, website has been around for a number of years and it continues to uh, help people invest in the community and if somebody's exiting their business there's business opportunities for them to purchase and also trying to attract a diverse workforce to the region and all of this is in your package that you've so diligently read this is a summary of our budget from last year but just to highlight that uh, we were able to take the city's eighty thousand dollars eighty thousand dollars and leverage it close to four times um, and another thing to highlight is in terms of the surplus, 100000 of that is actually dollars earmarked to the Innovation Centre. Um, so we're looking at carrying forward about $20,000. And then this maps out our budget for the upcoming year. So um, based on past revenue from local government partners, uh, it's got our projected budget there. Um, we do have about $300,000 in funding applications out right now um, for the purpose of the Innovation Centre. And uh, you can see we've allocated our spend according to the different uh, strategic goals for the program. So in terms of, um, you know, the future, we're hoping to see funding be maintained at the current level so that we can continue to do the work um, that's been set out by the advisory committee. All right. Thank you very much. So we have about eight minutes to take questions. Councillor Page. Yeah, thanks guys. Uh, one of my questions was around the basically preparing for the retirement of the baby boomers. Um, <clears throat> have we been doing any work? Is there some mentorship programs available that we are using to connect the younger generation with the older generation and see what kind of skill gaps will be occurring aside from just surveying? Like are there programs connecting the youth with the, the older generation? Well, I guess one piece to touch on is just the succession planning piece, so recognizing that the baby boomers are going to be looking to sell their businesses. That's a big part of the reason why uh, Imagine Kootenai was created, to help those businesses be sold and remain in communities as opposed to just closing their doors. Mm -hmm. um, and through the Basin Business Advisor Program, we do offer um, succession planning workshops, so helping business owners prepare to sell their business. We are going to be launching, uh, as of April 1st, a buying a business workshop, so to flip that on its head and get people thinking about buying a business. Um, and so where I see an opportunity there would be, let's market that workshop to youth, because um, that's where there's going to be information available about buying, buying a business. Okay, thanks. I think one of the other things when we were doing the, uh, the trades program, it was really pointed out to us that it, no point in having a 60-year-old guy tell somebody about how great it is being a plumber, bring in the apprentice plumber that's gone through the trials and tribulations of being 15 year old and sweeping out a shop to now becoming a 
Red Seal plumber and making $50,000 a year and driving his own truck when he's 23 years old. Those are the guys that can sell going into the trades and those are the guys that can really make it happen. Uh, there's no question that a person that's been in business for a long period of time, like a Cal Renwick or uh, people that have been doing the business community for a long time, if there's an opportunity to sit down and mentor, what a great opportunity. There's no question that uh, this, the, the wisdom can be passed down and people can pick up on some of those. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with a 60-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I agree. <laughs> Yes, Councillor Lockman. There goes your grant, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you said there were 2,000 job searches uh, on... Um, on the Imagine Kootenai uh, site. So Imagine two Kootenai. years ago, we went from just Invest Kootenai. So it used to be just called Invest Kootenai. It really had just the business component on it, community profiles of all of the participating partners. And then two years ago, we transitioned with uh, WorkWest Kootenai and to build it into the Imagine Kootenai site. So there is a workforce component on there and people go on they're looking for business opportunities they're also looking for job opportunities so um, my wife gets hired as she's an engineer she gets hired in the city of Nelson what else is there for me to do right. there's an opportunity for her to go there or all, or for him to go there or also to look at uh, the business opportunities that could possibly be purchased through Imagine Kootenai and there's a number that are for sale in the community that are li it's a free of charge service and it's just a great service that, that's been offered that uh, has helped certainly have a few sales and maybe even some foreign buyers have come in and purchased a business from our community as well mm -hmm. are those so those 2,000 people are primarily from out of the city if they were from outside of the region for sure yeah right okay cool great anybody else well, I think I know the answer to this um, but area E and area F are one of the core funders of this so we should take a moment and congratulate <laughs> those areas for contributing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'd like to step up. It's a model. It's a model for all the other organizations. There you go. All right. Any further questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, you guys. Thanks, guys. So our final presentation tonight, and we are <laughs> right on time. Um, is the Nelson Innovation Center. I just want to um, let Council know, you know, because the Innovation Center isn't one of our core groups. Uh, as you saw from the Economic Development Partnership, that was a strategic goal of the Economic Partnership, and since it was new, we thought it made more sense that <coughs> Tom and Andrea trying to squeeze it in their 10 minutes to give them a chance to tell you what that's about. And uh, that's why Cam's here. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so um, I'm Cam Whitehead. I'm the new uh, executive director for the uh, Kootenai Association for Science and Technology. Um, so you may wonder, well, what is CAST? Not everybody is aware of um, our activities. Um, we're a nonprofit. It was established in 1998 um, with a uh, board of directors, and our mandate is uh, for the promotion of uh, science and technology through business supports and supporting entrepreneurialism throughout the West Kootenai boundary. Um, we're most well known in the area for the uh, Midas uh, facility, the Midas lab uh, down in Trail, uh, which is a digital fabrication lab. Uh, also does uh, advanced metallurgical research. Um, and it's responsible over its three years, we've been pretty heads down focused on that, um, for over 75 uh, prototypes. Um, we've had 1,700 client visits in the last year. Um, 650 uh, students have toured it um, since, its, uh, since inception, and over 125 teachers have been uh, trained there. Over a million dollars in R&D uh, and uh, reinvestment in the community, uh, and it supported over six uh, 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 companies just on its own that wouldn't have existed otherwise, including uh, a single mom in, uh, in Nelson who started up a, a company and does the uh, two-hour round trip to, to Midas. So there's certainly a, a need for these sorts of business supports uh, in, in the area. Um, CAST also does uh, uh, business development throughout. Um, you may have heard the Venture Acceleration Program um, and also um, you know, mentorship events, sector uh, uh, promotion. We go down to the, the tech, sec uh, tech Summit every year. Uh, to sing the praises of Kootenai and the uh, 
uh, opportunities for having a, a, a tech business here in, in the Kootenays. So policy and partnerships is part of our mandate. So why, why us and why the Innovation Centre? Well, um, we've uh, sort of stepped up. Uh, I think the um, Innovation Centre has been looking for a bit of a, a, a home to come, come to, and I think CAST is, is, uh, is, a, is a great um, organisation. It's the sort of um, needed uh, uh, lead for, for this project. Um, we've got the experience, obviously, we've had the Midas facility up and running, uh, the capacity and the connections. Um, tech is obviously booming in, in Nelson, and a lot of that is uh, despite the available supports, not necessarily because of them, and we'd like to have a, have a space to support them. So the vision of the center is to drive regional uh, job and wealth creation. Um, so it's a, it's a broad mandate, and the, the purpose is to be able to create um, opportunities for youth um, to stay and get high paying jobs. Um, the, the way that we're going to do that is to c connect people and businesses to the supports they need to thrive in the tech sector. So that's connecting jobs uh, to people and people to jobs. Um, there's a lot available, um, but it's also for, for people and, and for businesses, uh, but it's often found in silos. Uh, there's federal resources, provincial resources, regional resources, uh, NGO resources, ground supports, all kinds of stuff for labor market attachment and business development, but um, the purpose is to be more of a, 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 a catalyst, um, a conduit to connect people and businesses to the supports they need. So it's going to provide a little bit of, of everything for everyone. Um, it's, it's meant to be a physical presence of Nelson's tech sector. Um, the tech sector is often hidden on second floors or in um, alleys. There's lots of startup culture that uh, you don't see the big, um, uh, the big facilities. Um, so this NAC will provide somewhere to go. It's somewhere to call. It's somewhere to get involved in the tech uh, uh, industry in Nelson and area. It will provide an affordable shared work experience or work lo uh, location, co-location for collaboration. This is an important part of uh, startup culture, uh, but it's more than a work, a co-working space. Uh, those exist here already. This is more about the, the concierge services. So again, it's connecting businesses to the capital, the funding and the workers that they need, and it's connecting workers to the employment supports, the training they need uh, and, and job opportunities. Uh, to fill the jobs that we're looking to create. So it's about up offering a space for, to, to deliver our business development supports and skills training programs. That's from, to take uh, ideas to the startup phase, to incorporation, to growth, to exports. Um, it's about commercialization, uh, commercializing these ideas. Also at NIC, it'll be a community building um, facility, so it'll be having events. It's a really important part, beer and pizza, maybe even chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's also about tech, uh, uh, tech sector promotion, so part of this is function is as people come into the community, it's a place to go, it's a place to see that there is a tech community in, in Nelson. Uh, part of that is an investment and talent attraction piece. So we're located um, in the, uh, the CP Rail Station, adjacent to, to Tom here in the Visitor Center. Um, we're uh, really excited at this location. It's a great marriage of uh, uh, heritage and high tech. Um, I'm a historian by training. I love this. Uh, there's some great uh, wood beams. Uh, the history of the building is fantastic. It, you can't beat it. And so we're looking to have that um, old and new connected. So it's currently uh, in renovations. I have one room. Uh, it has a, a table and a chair. Uh, this is uh, probably phase zero, uh, and so phase one here is the next stage that it's currently being um, renovated with the funds available, and phase two will occur when we've uh, secured uh, sufficient funds. It's a scalable business model is something I should say, so basically um, as I pitch it, more money means more impact in the community. We'll be able to have uh, uh, more fancier things available. <laughs> So the background in this is that, um, you, know, you, you know, a lot of you know the story, but I'll um, speak a little bit to it. So the BC's tech, tech sector is uh, what's changing the game in, in, uh, in BC, that the tech sector now employs more people than mining, oil and gas, and forestry combined. Um, it's a huge opportunity, especially for rural areas where um, geography tends to be the main barrier to transportation. Federal and provincial governments are investing heavily. This is a really excellent time for public sector, um, uh, you know, incubation and uh, this 
sort of thing. You just need to put up your hands and say that you have a tech sector in order to receive that, that funding from, from away. So NAC will support an active tech community of more than 700 tech and knowledge workers in the area. That's uh, just our Facebook group alone, uh, not to mention the uh, CAST um, Facebook group, which is another 700 that's in the region, and 300 tech or tech-related businesses uh, in Nelson. Um, NAC is uh, strategically located, particularly for CAST. We have our trail operations in uh, Midas, focusing on metallurgical research and uh, uh, extractive um, you know, mining-related uh, activities. Um, we feel that Nelson is a great expansion uh, place for CAST, uh, supporting the digital economy. Uh, there's a fiber optic network here, which is a big deal. Um, it, even for people in Victoria and Vancouver, it's something that certainly turns heads and goes, I can't get that in Vancouver, I can't get that in Victoria. I can get it at Nelson? Wow. Uh, the name recognition uh, and unique reputation of uh, Nelson is another big uh, selling point. So CAST has been a key partner in the development, uh, most recently uh, with me uh, <laughs> coming in and would like to operate in the NAC in the future. It's currently uh, uh, resides with uh, the NAADP, which is not a legal entity. We would like to be that entity to take it forward. So it's the culmination of three years. You've probably been hearing about this for quite a long time. We're looking to take it across the finish line. Um, we think it'll complement and add capacity to existing uh, programs and uh, We'd like to add this tech-specific concierge services. A few more minutes, that's great. Um, we're following a model of Accelerate Okanagan and Fort Tectoria um, that is to have that center, that physical presence. We've got a bunch of money, we're looking for more. Um, uh, we're looking, uh, we've got enough to get up to phase one and we're looking for phase two now. So our annual op operating budget um, will be <coughs> around 120,000. Our expenses will be about 171,000. So that's where you guys come in. Um, we've leveraged the funds that we've already, uh, uh, the, since, since inception, um, we've uh, put out applications um, for rural dividend fund. We've received two. We're looking to get the third. Uh, CAST has put forward uh, 50000 for project management. That's me. Um, we've applied for Columbia Basin Trust funding for 200000 uh, over three years, and that's for startup and operations. So it combined as a total confirmed of uh, 259 and we'll be looking to um, again double uh, what we get um, uh, in this pool uh, with Western diversification funding. So the more we have, the more we can leverage. Mm -hmm. So our funding request is for $50,000 and an annual operating fee for staff and administration specifically. So it's the phase of operations once it's uh, there and uh, 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 operational. So the principal benefits we'd really like to highlight in summary is that it's about jobs and about wealth creation. It's about um, achieving or you know, supporting the growth of high paying job opportunities for Nelson's youth. It's about socially and environmentally responsible export opportunities. At least the digital economy is something that uh, has no boundaries. You can sell to a global market. Uh, it is inclusive. Um, it is something that doesn't require a uh, advanced post-secondary. It's secondary. You can get a coding boot camp and be up in um, three to four months uh, and up and, and making money bidding on uh, the BC Dev Exchange, for example. That's it. Looking for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very efficient. <laughs> um, so we do have about 10, uh, ten minutes for questions. Councillor Page. Um, just help me m imagine where this phase is going in. I'm, try I'm looking at the floor plans that you provided here and seeing the stairs. Are you guys taking over the, you're on the second floor, right? No, no first floor. On the first floor, yeah. just off the, the first entrance. Don't scare Bill, here. I think just the stairs threw me off, so I was like. Yeah, yeah, it, it, there is a bit of a barrier between the two. The phase one uh, space will be for an anchor tenant. It's actually a, a benefit for them, is slightly separated. They can offer, they have their own designated meeting space and a couple of booths for, uh, for a solo, or, well, quiet workspace. And then phase two will be uh, the next. That's the more open uh, uh, plan um, for uh, shared office spaces, co-working, co-location, um, comfy places to sit. And maybe I missed it, but when do you expect Phase 1 to, to be ready and start taking in tenants? Uh, well, we're still waiting to hear back from RDF. I was supposed to hear back in um, November, uh, so I'm waiting on tenterhooks for that. Uh, but if all goes to plans, we hear tomorrow, we should be up and running by March, April, so. And, and that's for Phase 1. Phase 2, we the original uh, date was June. 
um, and that again is really funding dependent. So, thank you, Council Anderson. Yeah, um, can you just paint a bit of a picture for us of what jobs in the technology sector look like? What um, we can expect people to be earning in terms of wages, and what sort of those opportunities are for us in a rural area? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the great thing about um, high tech. Uh, jobs is that they pay quite a lot more. I'm, I'm trying to remember the percentage, but it's somewhere in the uh, the 40% more than the average industry wage. It's uh, very significant. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm looking for and what we would all like, there's a lot of innovation in Nelson. Mm -hmm. They're innovative people. They've been making a, trying to make a living here. And if you can add the ability to um, you know work from home, flexibility, it all works with the Nelson and area lifestyle. Um, and the, the types of job opportunities looking for, for example, data science, average wages are somewhere in the 80 to 90,000, um, and that there's there's more as you, as you go up and they're more specialized. I think the entry levels are you know somewhere around the 50, 60, um, and then it, it, the world's your oyster. A lot of, if you're starting your own company, um, you could be doing quite well. Um, there are a lot of remote workers in Nelson already. Um, we're looking to connect in with them and, and create that ecosystem to support them to grow other businesses, to find peers, collaborate, that sort of thing. Um, it's a great pitch to Silicon Valley companies to have a developer working here. They can um, pay them in Canadian, that's an immediate discount, uh, and then they can work here, uh, uh, work and live, and um, essentially if you can make 100,000 US or 150 here, uh, you can live like a king or queen. <laughs> that's, the, that's the vision. Anybody else? Yeah, Renwick? I'm, I'm a little rusty on this, the tech <laughs> stuff. Excuse me for that. Um, but so I'm just imagining, because um, <laughs> it kind of, I'm not getting my head around this too well. I'm imagining a young guy working probably from this facility to get going. Am I correct? They could, yeah, okay. for sure. And then moving on to, like, are they going to employ anybody or are they working by themselves? Oh, well, uh, you know. Uh, hopefully, they will employ people. That's the, the purpose, and our business supports do drive towards. Cam, is this the kind of thing that you know you could you start here and you you become a traction on demand? Can it? Is that the idea, or that could possibly be something that it could possibly be and okay. drive that kind of a growth? Um, we're not, you know, I'm realistic. Uh, it's <laughs> likely that the kind of Google, Apple companies are going to leave. Right. Uh, so we like, um, you know, companies that do uh, have three or four or five employ employees, that's fantastic. Uh, to employ that many people is a huge uh, benefit to the, right. the small and, community. And these are not, again, my age is showing, but okay. these are not gonna be your traditional, they're not looking for a spot on Baker Street, they're looking for an office, maybe on our fifth floor, that kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah, totally. Okay. And this provides a space, it's a, it's a location to have uh, social events, uh, to have collaboration, uh, to have meeting space. Uh, a really good benefit of these types of public sector incubators is to invite clients and customers down to a place that's not a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. You can have a, a private meeting space. Um, you can carry on confidential uh, conversations uh, and, and uh, it's more professional environment than a coffee shop. Yeah, I'd add to that, um, Cal. One of the, the, um, the ways this could, could roll out and has in a, in a small way already is a company like Shopify, for example. We may have, uh, Shopify is looking across Canada for, for, for employees, it's broadly, and, and a few companies like Shopify are doing that. And so Nelson has at least two, maybe more Shopify employees here. You can imagine if you get a third or a fourth, Shopify notices that and decides, well, you know, something's happening in Nelson, we, let's put them together. And once you get sort of a critical mass, let's say four or five, then it might become a, like a little subunit that they might actually invest in and grow it. So by getting people with the skills who are then applying for companies potentially all over Canada or into the US, um, then they tell their buddy, hey, I got this great job at X company. And then third person, as long as the skill base is there, you can start to build these little pods for sort of major companies all over the, all over the world. Whoa. <laughs> I really don't know. It's a new I... world. <laughs> um, I, I think Mayor that's Dilly? like, I, I know this is probably dating both Cal and I to an extent here, <laughs> but actually that's where I sort of, uh, I need to get up to speed a little bit more because people say the tech sector and like Councillor Luxembourg explains it from one section and then uh, Councillor Renwick sees it from another, I see it from somewhere else and 
Councillor Anderson potentially sees it. And if you go into healthcare, it's a whole other game altogether. And uh, just on that note, we were sort of jabbing each other here a few minutes ago. I spent four years working in the lumber industry, and you know there was a lot of tech people involved in the lumber sector. Uh, my son-in-law is is um, is a engineer, techie guy in oil and gas, as an example, and and it's huge, you know, in in that sector as well. And and so I'm I'm just wondering how we sort of get the message out that it's not some guy in a basement with a a television and, a, and a two thumbs on, on a thing. There's a whole thing. Back in the typewriter. I'm glad you're older. Than typewriter. Than you. <laughs> so, no, it's it helps all businesses. Yeah. Um, if you even in Nelson here, if you if you uh, you know each different t times that I've been campaigning, like I ended up in little offices and places where people actually were sort of techie people, but they were actually working on stream mitigation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, trout, uh, you know, Bet. you know, there's a whole techs involved in so many different things. And, and I just wonder if it ever gets explained that it's like, not just that mm. it's not Netflix and, and yeah. you know, what some people think it is, you know, it's not like, it's a, it's an amazing sort of area of um, opportunity from so many sectors, like your, your uh, uh, group and trail exists because of tech. Mm -hmm. Really, that's where it all started with with the uh, Cominco Tech, and Tech themselves have a huge section and that's involved in the tech industry. And if, if you went out to Klesnikovs tomorrow morning, like they couldn't function without somebody that was somewhere in the tech sector, right? So, so how do you sort of narrow it down, or not narrow it down, but explain to the to yeah. the greater community the advantages of um, you know how it integrates into everything almost everything you do really absolutely and every every sector is a tech sector yeah. as we say um that uh, in a great way that we can uh, point to a direct example was in the last year it was um, the midas facility uh produced um a 3d model of the uh, tech minko uh, kivset furnace um, it's a four foot model that they produced that allowed uh, their engineers to take a look at the inside of the furnace before they went in and during a shutdown which are very costly for tech minko it's able to save them how much money uh, by having um, you know a, a 3d printed model of, of their operations beforehand um, it's, a, it's just a way that you know um, a bunch of nerds can produce a thing in their basement uh, you know uh, and, and pay back and pay back uh, to the um, to the to the big people that yeah. there's, there's certainly a, uh, a value at, at all levels and yeah. you, you could be starting your own business um, Starting just interested in it to find to find work or um, all, all the way up to Tech Cominco, the biggest uh, you know, four billion dollar yeah. business. So, <clears throat> can I just Thank add you. to that? Because one of the um, things that we've been talking about is, you know, how do we use the innovation center to really brand and, and start to um, build that story of, of Nelson and area? Because we have all these businesses, we have all these people doing. Uh, different things, but we don't actually tell our story of who we are, what we do, and why you should be part of that story. It's you know, it's all little fragmented pieces all over the place, and the innovation center will be that piece that kind of pulls it all together and brands who we are, and and you know whether it's attracting you know people as as uh, Councillor Lottenberg said that are uh, coming here for lifestyle and can work for some company elsewhere or in the traction uh, situation where there was a Nelsonite that was successful somewhere else and he's uh, brought his, part of his company back here. So we wanna be able to reach out uh, people that you know, grew up in our area that you know, are looking for those avenues to come back. So there, you know, there's you know, having you know, a hub or something that can do that. Uh, interesting enough, I know, again, Councillor Lottenberg's talked about patents and how important that is and you know I went and met with Andrews Melpass uh, I think last week and he actually that's a big part of what he does as his business is he's actually really good at it and has a system down and here's you know where I spend money on lawyers and not on lawyers and here's when I get a patent and not a patent so we have that expertise in our community how do we you know use that knowledge to um, to help another business you know, not go through that whole learning curve and trying to figure this out when we have someone that's kind of 
got this thing dialed and that, I think that's the connecting the dot type piece that we're we're talking about mm -hmm. wow yeah. um, so yeah councillor page and then councillor Ottenberg. so coming from a, a, a tech background and an entrepreneurial background one of the challenges I, I understand with these types of projects is as you say everything is tech so what can you speak to any programs that will be available within the Innovation Center to basically field problems and pain points from customers, from municipalities, from regions, and creating opportunities for, for groups that want to participate in this space to solve some of those problems, like an ex, an ex what do they call that? Uh, I'm searching for it. Uh, help me out. There's a, NASA no does the X Games or something. There's a, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I'm, I'm barfing on the name of it, but there's there's programs available where basically someone sets up and says, "Here's 15 different problems. They're all worth ten thousand dollars a piece." Oh, you mean like a, a hackathon or a something? Oh, like or that, like yeah. an X prize? An X prize. Ah, there you go. <laughs> My tongue. <laughs> yeah, that's but like, that's a great idea. Yeah. No idea what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Just because it's like n nerds around a computer coming in a basement, one problem, focus solving that problem is, is where businesses are start. Yeah, it's, it's a great idea. Um, and at this stage, we're, we're putting, we're, we're creating the box, right? We're creating the box, we're getting the infrastructure in place to allow those sorts of, uh, those programs and events to uh, occur. I, I think they're great. We have a whole series of uh, 30 of them or so in our business plan, okay. uh, including, you know, the hackathons and um, that, that sort of approach. Uh, and then not to mention our own, uh, like CAST has its own program, the Venture Acceleration Program, um, and, and other business support, Startup Basics and, and that. Uh, there's loads in the community already available and we wanna take advantage of that and provide a space that's sort of under one one house and you can um, always know uh, where to go and we'll have, a, we'll have calendars, we'll have job postings, that, that sort of thing. Um, we have a significant budget for program design, so um, it's something that will be rolled out um, so, you know, well, we're taking ideas for sure. I, um, I just want to, um, we're now over time okay. and we still have to, we still have more meeting to do after this. So I think we should wrap it up. So thank you very much. Great. Cam. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any questions, please just get a hold of me. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, I think there's just two items here. Uh, any late items? Oh, we would have covered those earlier. I think. All right. And so I just need a resolution to adjourn. Just a second, and then uh, so all in favor? that was, yep. All in favor? Thank you. Do we adjourn or do we? No, no. no we're going to go back and finish it. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go. Good job, Jesse. Yeah, you did great. Yes. yes. Um, some chance you get elected again. <laughs> 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 we have to go back and get no. You know more about this stuff than I do. It's the worst. Leaning heavily on you for, for Now that the. It's, 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 it's,